Good morning, everyone. I'm Ipsita. A very warm welcome to all our distinguished speakers, delegates, and participants joining in virtually to the fourth day of the eighth edition of Eastern Himalayan Nature Genomics Forum. Well, we are very delighted to have you with us today, and we believe this final day of the discussion on ecology is economy would pave the way for our actions and way forward. As we open up the sessions for the day, we would like to inform you that we are also live on Balipara Foundation's Facebook page and YouTube channel. You can further watch the forum's coverage from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. on MuseX TV channel. So let's now begin with the first panel of the day, Ecology is Economy, Mindful Tourism, in conversation with eminent speakers, including Shobha Mohan, founder partner of Rare India, Usna Tara Prakash, co-founder and managing director of Glenburn Tea Estate and Boutique Hotel in Northeastern India. Joanna Van Gruesen, who runs a sustainable tourism initiative, the Sarai at Toria in Central India. Anna Ben Masozera, director of the International Gorilla Conservation Program. Jani D. Chauvez, Sustainable and Pollution Control Officer at the El Nido Resorts in the Philippines. Hello and welcome everyone to the Eastern Himalayan Nature Genomics Forum 2020. This is our first virtual forum uh, but the eighth edition of the, of the forum going on for the last many years in the Eastern Himalayas. This also happens to be, and I think thanks to the fact that it's virtual, it has happens to be the first very international mindful tourism panel that we are hosting. Uh, the focus this year of the Eastern Himalayan Nature Genomics Forum, uh, keeping in mind uh, the many events that the world has gone through in the last uh, few months, is really to talk about how we need to bring ecology to the center stage of the economy and sustainable enterprises form a critical part of how this transition can be made and how a post-COVID future-proof future can be created. Uh, we have today with us a great panel and I'm gonna start by giving very, very brief introductions. We have Anna B. Matosera, who's the director of the International Gorilla Conservation Program based in Rwanda. We have Demi D Jamie D. Chavez, who's the Sustainability and Pollution Control Officer at the El Nido Resorts in the Philippines. We have Joanna Van Grusen. Uh, Joanna is part of a sustainable tourism initiative called the Sarai Atoria in Central India. We have Husna Tara Prakash, who's co-founder and managing director of the Glenburn Tea Estate and Boutique Hotels in the Northeastern part of India. And today, moderating the show will be Shobha Mohan, who's the founder partner of Rare India. Over the next hour, we'll, we, we really want to highlight some of the best case studies for mindful tourism across the world and use this panel as a learning for the rest of the Eastern Himalayas as, as a way forward for the tourism industry in a part of the world which contains a lot of its biological diversity, a lot of cultural diversity, and how can we use tourism as a means for conservation, not just of biodiversity, but of actually being able to enhance cultures as well. I'm gonna now pass on to Shobha to take this session forward. Thanks very much. Thank you, Saurav. That was very, very crisp and very well put. Uh, today we have, uh, the, the way the, the panel is uh, looking is that we have two people who are, have concentrated all their efforts in building and uh, creating a positive impact for the community and we have uh, two uh, others who actually work with uh, nature and environment and uh, and uh, uh, you know in in their areas of operation so uh, it would be uh, interesting to see what each one of them do so without much uh, without miss wasting much time i uh, will uh, will kind of have them each one of them talk to us about uh, what they do uh, in their uh, uh, in their tourism products as a part of their tourism product and why they do it, which I think is a very, very important part of um, every conservation story. So should we uh, begin with uh, Joanna? Do you want to go first? 
it's very nice to be here today. It's an honor and a pleasure. And uh, I may be the oldest person on the panel, but I may be the youngest in tourism because I joined it only 10 years ago. My background was actually in wildlife filmmaking and photography. And I'm married to a, a Raghu, a biologist who had studied the tigers in Panna Tiger Reserve, Central India. And when that was completed, we wanted to come back and do conservation, but we needed some kind of economic base. So that was when we decided to look at tourism. Near the Tiger Reserve um, are some amazing temples. And I'm going to start sharing my screen because I can't talk about them without just showing you one of them at least. And um, so these are the Kajrao temples. They're a thousand years old. And it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and completely fantastic. But we found that tourists would come in for one night, they'd fly into Kajra, they'd stay in a hotel which could be anywhere in India or anywhere in the world even, and they'd fly out. So all they did was see. They didn't get beyond that and the um, benefit of them coming didn't go beyond that. So we thought we could uh, do, uh, we could find a niche there for ourselves. So a little outside the town, about half an hour away, 20 minutes, we found uh, an area where we um, built an eight uh, room lodge, which we called the Sarayatoria. We also have a, had set up a small NGO uh, trust called Bowen. Bowen in Hindi means 52 and was named after one of the study tigers, which I put a little picture in the corner. I don't know if you can see, but she has like a five and a two written above her eyes. So that's where the name came from. So we sit in about 11 acres of land. We have eight rooms and the rest we've allowed to go wild. It used to be overgrazed farmland. And we looked at the local architecture to, um, I mean, our main aim was to have a low footfall. So we looked to local designs and mud was the most sensible for the climate. So we built in mud and um, basically our idea was to keep it simple, but to have all the necessities, all the things we wanted to see in a hotel room without anything extra. But um, the main thing was to bring tourists to stay longer in the area and to experience a little more and in a little more depth. And we're right by the Cane River, which is a beautiful place for boating and Zen-like, it's been said. So it's very good for um, bringing in mindfulness as our, our yoga class is by the river. The... Um, key point of the stay really is all the staff who are from the local area and bring in the um, interaction and help people to understand more clearly the kind of um, culture that they're staying in. However, one of the things we um, immediately found was that tourism, wildlife tourism, because we were always also wildlife tourism, being next to a wildlife reserve and wildlife people ourselves, has a very bad name in India. And people tend to think that it's exploitative and it's just a few people making lots of money out of um, the wildlife that is held, you know, looked after by the government. So, the, but there's no, there was very little information to say that. So the, one of the first things we did as an NGO was collaborate with Toft Tigers and do a tourism study in Madhya Pradesh amongst four tiger reserves. And even we were surprised at how much this kind of unplanned tourism actually fed back into the community. And overall, it generated 166 crore rupees, which is around nearly $26 million, 45% of which went into the local economy, um, which meant $11.7 million a year, which is really pretty substantial. And it also created a you know, large number of jobs because there was 85% percent, 80% uh, local employment. And on top of that, 85% of it was actually budget travel. So, you know, there weren't a lot of people making a lot of money, but there was a lot of money going into the local community. So we realized that that, you know, might be a good way to, um, I mean, that tourism could be a good catalyst for further conservation. In India, all the conservation is done by the government. It's all in the hands of the government. And it's um, protected in areas which are what they call inviolate, which means people are not um, allowed to live in it. So it's a very exclusive conservation. And since that's the only, um, they're the only ones who do it, means that 
we don't really have very much conservation tourism here. And that was something we wanted to explore. So to do that, um, we um, looked, found an area which was beyond the protected area and beyond the buffer area of the protected area, but still had some wonderful forest, which belonged to the government, but um, you know, was not being used for conservation protection. So basically wanting to take the tourism, I mean, the conservation beyond protected areas and also wanting to use an inclusive model, we have started to get to know the community in those areas and work with them initially um, through sort of entry level activities like um, nature education, we're working a lot with the schools and also with health camps, you know, eye camps. And now the bottom right picture is showing our um, support teacher who is the only one who's carrying on education in the region because the schools are all closed due to the COVID problem. So the idea is that, you know, we would eventually like to see tourism being, you know, more active and spreading conservation and development. And we think there are ways that, you know, everyone can benefit. The tourists can benefit by having a much more inclusive and deep experience. And the local community, you know, can benefit and the and wildlife also, you know, if tourism is um, handled mindfully and used as a driving force for conservation as well as development. So we're still in fairly initial stages, but we hope to take it forward and um, look forward to sharing our ups and downs as we go along. Yeah, great. Thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, my name is Anna Bim Massozera, and I'm the director of the International Gorilla Conservation Program, and I'm joining from Kigali in Rwanda. And so I'm very happy to share with you uh, from another part of the world um, and another, another species and story entirely. Um, the International Gorilla Conservation Program is, is uh, a special program. It's a coalition program and it's been around for approximately 40 years. And our story is really about cooperation, collaboration, facilitating dialogue and agreement around mountain gorillas. And we're a little bit different from the other panelists um, in that we don't actually manage any tourism product, we don't manage any park, um, we don't own any properties, so we are exclusively a conservation organization grounded in conservation science and again facilitating dialogue and agreement um, as a core tenet of what we do. Um, and just to note that the mountain gorillas are very small um, to population. This um, in Rwanda, Uganda, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. So, how does mindful tourism factor into to the mountain gorilla story? And it actually factors in quite um, prominently. So, um, you might be aware that of all the great ape species globally that are not us humans, it's actually the mountain gorilla as a subspecies that has stable or growing populations. Um, over the last 30 years. And a big part of that is, is because of the interest that the global community has, um, a, as well as the cultural and economic significance of, of these species at a, at a local level. So actually, mountain gorilla tourism was introduced and it was, it was put in place very quickly. Um, that actually stopped the conversion of forest um, from mountain gorilla habitat to uh, land for human use, whether it's agriculture or livestock. And, and since then, over the last uh, 30 years, it's really grown to, to be you know, quite a, a, a pretty special experience, a wildlife encounter experience. Um, uh, and it's, it's quite profound to be able to be so close to such a charismatic species um, and being allowed into their habitat. So in and of itself, that's quite a, a spiritual experience for, for most people, um, similar to what Joanna was saying about uh, the temple. Um, and so the success of 
of tourism features prominently in the success of the continued existence of mountain gorillas. And what I'll also let you know is that it's not unique to, to mountain gorillas. So, so this map shows you all the different sites um, that pre-COVID-19 actually offered some type of great ape um, tourism experience on the continent. So mountain gorilla is only one of four subspecies of gorilla on the continent. Um, and so mountain gorilla, grower gorilla, western lowland gorilla, the different subspecies of chimpanzee, um, and even bonobo. So these are you know, over 20 sites where um, some form of wildlife experience with great ape um, is there. Um, and I will say, um, even now in, in November, um, two, two, let's see, three out of the four mountain gorilla sites are actually open for tourism. Um, and it's mostly domestic tourism at this point in time. So like I said, um, mountain gorilla tourism has really been a, a cornerstone to the success story. Um, and it's, it's, its principles are, are grounded in having a sustainable model for the continued conservation of mountain gorillas. And so in terms of contributing to employment, um, what you see here is a group of, of porters waiting at a, at a tourist point to be um, a, to a tourist group to go into the national parks um, to visit mountain gorillas, to uh, products that are um, sold to, to the tourists from, from the neighboring community. Um, and so the impact is really at local level, but not only that, at, at national and regional level as well because of the success of, and really the overwhelming global interest to travel to come to the, um, mountain gorillas is actually it contributes to um, you know, the, the top or within the top three uh, foreign income earning at a national level for Rwanda and Uganda. Um, and all of that feeds into to development locally, development nationally, and also back into protection and, and conservation work. Um, so what we've, we've come to appreciate, and um, we were starting to appreciate this even before COVID-19, is that this is a very fragile model um, and made even more prominent um, under COVID-19. And so it really challenges us to think about what are the core tenets of why mountain gorilla tourism? Who's involved? Who is it benefiting? And, and how do we sustain this over the long term? And so again, we don't manage any products. We don't take any decisions regarding how tourism around mountain gorillas is, is, is taken. So what we've done is that we've partnered with Wildlife Friendly Enterprise Network uh, to develop a series of standards and voluntary certification schemes um, around certified gorilla friendly. Um, so we have the, the standards for parks, tour operators, hotels and lodges, and in fact, even guides. We also have the, the certified gorilla friendly park edge community products. So how does a tourist distinguish what has flown in from another part uh, of the country or the region from what is you know, genuinely made by, by people who, who share the landscape with mountain gorillas? And then also the Gorilla Friendly Pledge, which is a way that um, anyone who is visiting mountain gorillas or cares about mountain gorillas can log into gorillafriendly.org and, and kind of take a pledge to those core tenants um, around um, the protection of mountain gorillas, around you know, the, the transparency and good governance of, of how people are involved in mountain gorilla conservation, um, and so we, we, because we facilitate dialogue and agreement rather than um, take decision making, um, we've gone this route of, of creating a set of standards that, um, again, in a voluntary um, scenario, people can sign on to. So our dream would, would be to have a number of, of operators um, similar to those that are participating on this panel actually sign into it. Um, work more collaboratively together to make sure that the mountain gorilla product is something that would 
continue to secure the future for mountain gorillas. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Anna. That was uh, very insightful. And with Joanna talking about tigers and temples in central India and you talking about uh, gorillas. So uh, about the conservation of gorillas. Jo the one thing I wanted to uh, you know, reiterate is that uh, you you are the government, right? I mean, you work with, with, with your, your policies are set by the government and you work with the government to put out these uh, uh, restrictions or these uh, principles for tourism for uh, gorilla conservation? Uh, so it's a good question. Um, the regulations on all the tourism within the park and even outside of the park is set by, by the government. Um, those are separate from the Gorilla Friendly Standards. So this is a voluntary set of standards um, that either a private entity or the government in terms of their parks would sign on to. Um, and then they go through a process of participatory auditing of, of their operations leading to the certification. So they are in tandem with each other. So yes, policies and regulations around Mountain Gorilla is set by the government, um, and we are a partner to them in the conservation of mountain gorillas, but very separate from the gorilla-friendly standards themselves. Um, we've had a lot of conversations about how these standards um, get adopted into regulations. Um, for example, tour operators, um, when they're getting their operating license, they, they have to reach a set of standards set by the government. Um, and some of what is included in certified gorilla friendly is actually of interest more broadly. And so there is a possibility of uptake regulations, but two separate processes. Two separate processes. And which kind of, uh, which is a bit similar to what we have in India, in India that Joanna will talk about. But, um, you know, but it is also uh, in the sense, these kind of, um, uh, we, we don't have a very, um, uh, we don't have very active organizations working with the government to set some of the policies. Is that right, uh, Joanna? Well, I don't think we have a very active government policy here, in fact. So the tend to not be regulations unless they've been um, encouraged by an organization like Toff Tigers for yeah. um, places around the parks. But the parks themselves, I think, are at fault in not having more um, rigorous rigorous advice. standards yes. yeah, standard. and when they do come up with standards then they bring them out without much discussion with the people who are actually operating on the ground so they're not you know they're not necessarily um, appropriate or the ones that would be acceptable which is another problem I mean obviously they can restrict the number of people who go into the national parks um, which they do but uh, and that's that's good but that doesn't stop a lot of um, proliferation of tourism outside which then causes a mismatch because you may have a lot more um, hotel space, bed space than you do park capacity. And that can lead to some very unfortunate results because people obviously you know, have set up a business and need to find tourism from somewhere to make their ends meet. So, so what you mean is that the regulations or have the are for people to either create for themselves and follow it because they believe in it or you know you have somebody like Toff Tigers who kind of lays out and does an audit for you right yeah and also I mean like the state government Madhya Pradesh for example within the last year before COVID at least had had a meeting about tourism and the brochures and things that they put out were really quite shocking in the sense that they were giving incentives and encouraging people to set up hotels around places like Bandavgarh, which is a tiger reserve in central India that is already completely oversubscribed. You know, so they they didn't they don't seem to get the situation at all. Rather than, I mean, what we really need, because in India people come to see tigers, obviously, it's a big attraction, but there are only four or five places that, you know, where you have a chance of seeing it. So what really needs to happen is to spread that because you obviously don't want to put more and more people in those parks and they're quite right to restrict that. But it would be nice and not impossible to have a lot more areas where people could see tigers. So, um, you know, rather than just concentrate them all around. The on that there, yeah. There. Yeah. Which is, yeah, yeah, and carrying capacities are a big issue anyway. Great. Thank you so much, Joanna. We, um,
Are you ready? Uh, Jamie, I, you want to go next? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'll start in the second slide now. So first, a, a little background into who we are. Um, our operations is based in Palawan, which has been voted as the best island in the world. So there has been a lot of influx of people in the past couple of years. And well, the company started in 1979 and it started with a partnership with the Japanese, which just have so much love for nature and want to see it thrive. So in 1981, we opened the first island resort in the whole municipality, which is Pinilok Island. And this was followed in 1998 by Lagan Island Resort. And then we also went to another municipality, an adjacent municipality in Tai Tai, and opened up a Putit Island Resort. And then finally, in 2012, we have a Pangulushan Island Resort. So in 2013, we were acquired fully by Ayala Land Inc., which is one of the biggest corporations in the Philippines. And it is very known in being one of the best real estate developers in the country. And so in 2014, we launched Leo Tourism Estate, which is a 325 hectare fully master planned tourism estate. So the turtle is actually everywhere in our operations. So in 1984, the company was instrumental in the declaration of the bay as a turtle sanctuary. And then we also have a program called Be Green, where green stands for guard, respect, educate, and lido. And as you can see, the logo is of a turtle. And then we also have nameplates worn by staff in the shape of a turtle. And we feature them very fondly and a lot in our materials that we use. Of course, seeing them in tours is always a highlight in the guest experience. And we even have a boat that is named a pawikan, a turtle. So that's a tour boat that you can ride on. And finally, during the pandemic, we have now the Be Green and Be Clean, Be Clean program, which is our commitment to enhance care, bearing also the same turtle logo. So there are three main ways in which we promote mindful tourism. First, we ensure that travel can be as guilt-free as possible by looking at ourselves and the ways in which we can tread lightly as a company through sound policies and investments. So investments such as resource efficient equipment, sewage treatment plants, and materials recovery facilities, and solid waste management facilities in general are just some of the very important ways we help ensure efficient use of our finite resources. And then we also have policies like local sourcing, plastics ban, and sustainable menus to curb negative impacts in our planet. Next, we also use education to bring awareness not just to our guests, but also to the staff in the communities as well. Part of our Be Green program are trainings on conservation given to staff, suppliers, um, contractors, merchants, and locators, so everyone basically that we work with in the business. And this facilitates grounding and alignment as we work towards the conservation goals. We also find ways to always engage guests the, from the moment they come into the resort all the way to when they get out. And this is done through environmental briefings and presentations. We have eco checklists that we give them so that they'll be encouraged to actually look for animals and try to identify them. And we also have guided tours with nature interpretation. So you can have guides that actually know the place and can identify the different species that you can find in the area. And we also do simple chats and catch ups with our guests to see how their, how their um, trip has been like and what sorts of wildlife they've seen and what interests them and what they want to know more about. And of course, we also take advantage of social media where we talk about our efforts, as well as promote sustainable and responsible tourism. So during this lockdown, we took the advantage of the downtime to create a webinar series on reef conservation. So if you want to check that out, then please follow our pages. Being part of the wildlife friendly enterprise network for us doesn't mean that we only focus on the particular animal that we have been certified in. It means making efforts at conservation and conserving entire ecosystems and creating as much partnerships as we can so that we can be successful. So apart from educating, we also actively engage everyone that we work with to have like sim simple efforts like coastal cleanups, tree planting, and also get into the more challenging tasks 
of uh, creating sustainable alternative sustainable livelihoods and then we also try to rally for community support and at the same time push for better laws and policies so we work a lot with the local government and even the national government especially at this time that we have the COVID pandemic and we're trying to reopen. So we believe that um, more than being mindful, businesses should also strive to be re regenerative as well. So here's a turtle, one of which we have been releasing for the past couple of years. And we hope to have a lot more turtles and wildlife that will thrive in the area. Thank you. That was great, uh, Jamie. That was really wonderful. Uh, one a question that uh, came to my mind when you were you know, um, talking about this. So you you talked about uh, creating education for your travelers, right? Um, yes. And yeah, and also, uh, into, I mean, your entire uh, program through their stay at the property at your at one of your lodges or one of your resorts is to constantly engage them in um, in activities that is, that allows them to understand conservation or understand why they are doing you know why they should be looking after the sea turtle and how they can be contributing right so um yes. do you are you able to um what's your success rate i mean do you think everybody gets interested and do you feel do you find people you know some of the people are not uh, really all there and they want to do something else does that happen there's also a lovely blue sea out there then there could be several other things they might want to do right well we, i think we can never really like capture everybody but so far in our experience and also in my personal experience i think we are at 98 percent engagement because once you actually talk to the guests and tell them what they can see, what they can experience, um, why they're there, and what their role is in everything in the world. They become really interested and they want to learn more. And then when they come home, they want to do more. So in things like turtle releases, although I think this is this has a little bit of bias because turtles are just really cute and it's very easy to capture people with them. So every time we have the turtle release, you know how some people can, you will, you will notice from the get-go that they just want to be there for the photo and then they want to leave right away. But then when we, once you start engaging them and then we talk about the turtles, their importance, the threats, all of a sudden after the after everything has been done, they start picking up trash and then putting it in the trash bin. So they immediately have um, changes like that. So I think yeah, it's really yeah. about efforts in communicating with everyone as much as possible. Brilliant. And your clientele is mostly um, local travelers. Um, you might have of... um, so far 50%, 50-50, like foreign and domestic. Domestic, wonderful, yeah. That's really great. And we'll come to, I, I'll come back to the question of how you, uh, how you engage uh, people co totally and, you know, how do they get, they, how can they participate after they have gone away? Right, we'll come to that later. We'll have Usna introduce um, Glenburn uh, Tea Estate and uh, Penthouse and the work that she's been doing with uh, the community, especially in the tea estate. Husna, over to you. Thank you, Shoba. Thank you, Zora, for inviting me to this wonderful panel. The wonderful thing about going last is that I've had a time to enjoy and absorb <laughs> all the wonderful things I'm hearing about from mountain gorillas and tiger conservation to the amazing sustainability practices that Jamie's um, using at her hotel. It's, it's, we're all part of this community around the world, I think, that believes in the same ideals and principles. And it's, it's wonderful to share this, um, this this sort of time together. So I'll just um, share screen and take you through my journey, which was um, something that happened very much by accident. I, I trained to be a science teacher and happened to um, meet my husband when I was backpacking around the world when I was 18. And uh, he happened to be a tea planter. And I sort of moved based from where I grew up in England back to India and ended up marrying into a a fourth generation tea planting family. So that was 23 years ago. And um, I stumbled into hospitality because of the sheer beauty of the tea estates that we uh, that we owned and we were visiting. And we thought that it would be really interesting to sort of model the tea experience on the vineyards around the world. So it started off as an experiment. Um, and that was almost 20 years ago. And two years ago, we opened our second hotel in Calcutta, the Glenburn Penthouse. 
And um, in between that, we've also been um, uh, running tours in Calcutta and private excursions. Uh, so our tea estates are in the east of India, and one is in Darjeeling, and the other is in Assam. Um, and it was really Glenburn that just, you know, took our breath away when we first visited, because uh, from the estate, you look up to Mount Kanchenjunga, the third highest mountain in the world, and it was really heaven. So we thought, you know, we must do something to draw people um, into this region. Uh, and we have eight rooms, eight suites that are in um, two bungalows. Uh, we started off with just four. And then um, when we realized that people were really appreciating what we had created in the original manager's bungalow, we decided to replicate that into a second bungalow. So now we have um, eight rooms. Uh, but if you look at Glenburn Tea Estate as an estate, um, you can see how in the 758 hectares, we actually have more protective forests than we have tea. And that's what really made um, Glenburn a really interesting uh, tourism project um, in many ways, because there was so much to protect within the forest, as well as so much to talk about when it came to the tea. Uh, and a tea estate is really like a mini kingdom. And we have three primary schools within the estate. We have uh, eight villages, we have temples, we have churches, we have Buddhist monasteries. And, you know, the community that live here were brought across um, into India from Nepal in the 19th century by the British planters that wanted to set up um, the tea estate. So they've been here for four or five generations. And much of our work is also uh, preserving and celebrating their local traditions and their customs. Um, we also have two rivers that run through the estate. Uh, so it really is a beautiful collection of landscapes. Um, of tea fields, of flowers, birds, butterflies. Um, so, you know, the journey to discover this has been very organic over 20 years. I never thought that I would be here uh, 20 years later. And our most recent uh, project has been to, to work at conserving the Golden Marcia, which uh, this, this black and white picture is actually from a family album from one of our managers uh, from the 1920s. And you can see the size of this fish. Um, and this one on the left was actually caught during the pandemic, catch and release, of course, it was put back into the river. Um, but before the pandemic, the size of the fish was absolutely tiny. And there were all these illegal fishing methods that were being used, things like bleaching powder and, and dynamite and electricity to kill the fish. So the, for the last few years, we've been trying to work on on educating the locals to try and allow these beautiful fish to thrive um, to what they used to be. Um, and then the other aspect of what has happened so organically is the awareness of what goes into that cup of tea that you know millions of people drink every day. There are about 15,000 cups of tea drunk every second. It's the most drunk beverage in the world after water. And Darjeeling tea actually comes from a very select part of the world. So just, just like champagne can only come from champagne, Darjeeling tea can only come from 87 tea estates up in the mountains, um, of, uh, up in the foothills of the Himalayas in Eastern India. And uh, so it's a very small amount of production, but it has a very high value. And what's happened over the years is that the cost of production has gone up, but the cost of tea hasn't really gone up. Um, so compared to our tea estate in Assam, where we make millions of kgs of tea that sells at a much lower price, in Glenburn, we make just a small amount of tea, but because it, it needs to sell it at quite a high price to, to sort of support the economic model of the tea estate, um, these estates are struggling. So a lot of them are now financially um, uh, sort of unviable. So what we've done over 20 years is actually brought a huge number of tourists into the estate and they have actually realized um, this human face that comes um, with that cup of tea that nobody really appreciates. And there are a thousand workers and their families that live on the estate um, and, you know, their jobs are guaranteed for life and then are passed on to the next generation. Um, you know, the, the um, estate provides housing, medical care, subsidized food rations, pension funds. Uh, these are all the incredible benefits that come within um, the tea estate and the family of tea workers that live within the estate, almost four to 5,000 workers, including all their families. Uh, so each cup of tea that people drink uh, actually represents these people. And that's something that um, very mindfully has now been transmitted to all the people that have visited Glenburn over the last 20 years. And um, Ranjan, for example, who works at the hotel, is the fourth generation from his family that have worked on the estate. And uh, since I took this picture, his, his great grandparents have actually passed away and now he has two children of his own. And it's just a wonderful legacy that's been passed down um, the generations. We also uh, promote a lot of women. Uh, of course, the, the 
bulk of the workers are actually women because they pick the tea, uh, but we're also promoting them to supervisory positions and also educating um, a lot of girls as part of an education program that we started uh, about 15 years ago. And we now provide um, extra teachers and enhance the facilities of the government run primary schools within the estates. But we've also added a kindergarten and, and a nursery section to these schools. We've provided, we pay salaries to extra teachers. Um, we've helped with classrooms, uh, with uniforms, and just the, the wonderful interaction that we have between the guests and the children uh, when, the, when the visitors come. Uh, we've had uh, reading libraries and holiday workshops, and our scholarship program supports 64 children in um, secondary schools, uh, private schools in the region. So this was our first batch of, of seven or eight kids, and this little girl in the middle and this boy, Ligan, over there, Nikita, they're all now in their year 12. And in 2014, Nikita got sort of student of the year, and then two years ago, she was head girl, and this year, she's due to finish school and she wants to become a doctor. So, you know, looking back to these kids that started with us when they were four and a half or five years old, it's just been a wonderful journey for many of them. Um, we also support music and dance and the local Nepali culture through um, a, an annual festival and um, a dance and music academy where we have teachers that come and um, teach anyone who's who's interested. So this is these are scenes from the annual festival and the, the girls dancing. So the boutique hotel has really um, uh, sort of brought this into the community, but in what we hope is a sustainable um, manner and an, a, an organic manner that has promoted um, education um, and uh, skills and naturalist um, skills and hospitality skills to a group of people that would never really have been exposed to the kind of guests that we have from all around the world. And um, we have 55 staff members working in our eight-room hotel, all from local villages. So from their um, sort of cooking skills, their driving skills, they're, they're all our guides and naturalists. Everything has been learned on the job. We don't have a single professionally trained member of staff. And it is really them who bring the experience uh, to each and every guest. And over the years, we've been um, featured in international magazines and more recently, even in India, um, we were awarded the best luxury hill resort in India, and this year, the most responsible hotel in India, which was our proudest award, of course, um, thanks to our work with the community. So we've come a long way from my first uh, trip to the World Travel Mart when I had four rooms, and people used to laugh at me and say, really, is four rooms a hotel? Um, they couldn't quite understand how I, I could take a four-room hotel seriously, but it's been a wonderful journey. Um, and I was just, just before the presentation, I was trying to do some maths with my daughter. I said, we have about 50 to 60% occupancy during the day and eight, uh, during the year and eight rooms. And we worked out that actually three and a half thousand visitors come to Glenburn every year, which means that over 19 to 20 years, 65,000 people have come to Glenburn. And even I hadn't processed that amount until I did the maths just sort of half an hour ago. And um, all these people now know exactly what goes into making that cup of Darjeeling tea and also will hopefully go back and tell their friends about the work that we're doing. So there was never a plan. It was just meeting the right people at the right time, people like Shoba, <laughs> who sort of helped me take uh, Glenburn where it is and, and learning from other people in the community like Joanna with the sustainable practices that all the members of the rare community practice and learn from each other. Um, and uh, it's been organic and it's been wonderful to make this journey. So if we brought mindful tourism into Eastern India. It's been something that we've done with the local community and it's all their credit, <laughs> credit due to them. Thank you. Thank you. Every time I see your presentation and there's something new to learn always, the 65,000, that number is mind boggling really. <laughs> yeah. So Husna, also, I mean, we'll, we'll start off with you um, on the, uh, the next uh, part of the uh, the questions for the panel, uh, you know, obviously out of the 65,000, a large part would be, uh, you know, guests will be from UK, right? That's that's your that's your TG, if you can. Uh, it yeah. started off with the UK, but I have to say the last maybe eight to 10 years, we've had an equal amount from Australia, New Zealand, America, Europe, 
um, you know, the, the English have been, were definitely my source market to begin with, because of course I had a connection with England. I used to do a lot of my marketing over there. But since then, it's really spread to many different nationalities. I think um, South America is probably the only continent and possibly Africa where we don't have a huge number of guests from, but we've tried. Yeah, um, yeah brilliant. And so if you were to imp uh, measure impact for travelers, you know, coming, who've been coming, uh, do they do a lot of them, you know, I mean, 65,000 is a big number. I'm still trying to process it too. Uh, as a, yeah. So as a part of uh, impact building, do they keep in touch? Do, do they continue to support an initiative? Uh, does that uh, that uh, does that happen? Yes, we have many repeat guests and we've had people who come back four or five times. Each time they'll come back for a longer period of time. Um, we've had people reach out to us during the pandemic, checking on the staff, checking on, you know, how things are, how, how we're managing. Um, and of course, the, the scholarship program, um, we actually had to slow it down last year because we had so many offers of sponsorship and, um, you know, it's, it's quite challenging to actually get foreign funds into India under a charity. And that's something that, that um, you know, we, we have to tie up with, um, you know, with other charities to try and do that. Um, so that was actually the only reason that stopped the momentum that was building up. Um, but then once we had those 64 kids in school, we were like, okay, this is, this has to continue. continue um, we've, yeah. we've um, you know, taken a pledge to see all these kids through school. And now the, you know, one of the oldest children, um, she was actually sponsored to go to Loreto College in Darjeeling. Um, in Darjeeling and, yeah. sponsor. and then she's now studying at the International Hospitality Management School in Calcutta. And she's wow. actually the daughter of one of our drivers at the hotel. And she's in her second year and won an award for Rookie Chef of the Year last year. So you know, now our challenge is now how to, you know, sustain, um, you know, these the careers for these children, because um, we really want them to use their education to, you know, to take it forward. And, and many years ago, um, when I started with this program, it was inspired by Pratham, which was a, a big NGO that worked on education. They were sending a training group into our region. And I met the, the the team and I said, can you do the same for Glenburn? And they said, I'm sorry, but Glenburn's not on our list. So I said, okay, can I send my people to learn from you? You don't have to fund it, I'll fund it, but can they learn how to measure literacy on the estate, how to set up these reading libraries and take it forward? And the lady that introduced us actually wrote to the Darjeeling Planters Association and said, look what Glenburn's doing on their own accord. Why don't more tea estates do this? And many of the responses that came from them, I'm embarrassed to say, was we don't want to educate the workers because they'll run oh off and do other things. Yeah. And, you know, my, it didn't even come to mind. I didn't even think of that. You know, for me, yeah. it was like the more we can do, you know, the, the, the we will do. And, you know, so it's it's been something that's been extremely impactful within our region. And, 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 and this is a, entirely your own initiative. I mean, there's obviously no help from the uh, government in, no. in, your, in any of this. Yeah. But, but it's amazing how, it, like I said, it, it was so organic. Like I never had a master plan. I never okay. even wanted to become a hotelier. So it's amazing Thanks. how things happen if you just, if you know, if you put one pebble into the stream, the ripples start, and then suddenly it becomes like a tidal wave. It, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, Jamie, I mean, talk, uh, coming to you, I, I'm very uh, curious to know about uh, the impact and if people continue to uh, support you, even after they are, I mean, have, they have stayed and gone. Of course, there is always the repeat guest, I mean, them coming back. Uh, do you see that they support your initiatives, even if they are, uh, I mean, long distance? Yeah, that's a very good question. Well, we do... Um, somehow managed to keep in touch also with a few of our guests, especially in our team with the environmental officers, the ones who really get to like talk to them and they add us up on Facebook. Even the staff get added up on Facebook and they just follow our Facebook pages also. And they keep the engagement and we see that it's been really good so far, especially with the COVID pandemic. It's been very hard, but then we've been lucky enough to have had like three very recent, very generous donors also, who were able to fund four new projects for us. And these projects were able to hire a lot of the um, locals that were, that whose work got displaced. So right now we have efforts because of them and it's still continuing and we can see that it will be able to continue until like the end of the year. So 
the engagement is just really it great. Uh, we have yeah, we have guests who message us asking us like when can we fly? Um, I'm excited. Uh, I already have a booking for this year, but um, it's okay. I still go next year. So yeah, fantastic. Yeah, great. Uh, great, Jamie. Uh, Joanna with Bhavan, do you see the same? Uh, do guests um, involve themselves and are they are in touch with you once they are? Uh, they are back in their homes or in their countries. Uh, Joanna, you're muted. That that is something that happens, and I think you know there was um, what we were hoping would happen. But as Husna says, it it is actually quite difficult to get funds from abroad now, and it's just becoming even more difficult in the last couple of weeks. So that's you know we've we've had offers through COVID, but um, from foreign nationals, it's too difficult to receive yeah. funds yeah but no everybody you know even i mean before we started um in the further away area we were working with our local school in toria village so um a lot of people were donating and getting involved in that also with the, with the no, bowen project right with the bowen project yeah yeah joanna one of the things which always um you know i'm always motivated by is uh, which is against everything I have learned before I met Raghu and you is that Raghu always believed that Raghu and you always believe that the money has to be, you know, the, the community has to, the, the money from tourism has to go to the community. I mean, as money, I mean, uh, while everybody would say giving them money would make them, you know, this and, you know, they might get lazy and things like that. But you and Raghu believe that they should be compensated in cash so that they can lead a better life, right? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think I'm being quite a believer in direct payment, but there's actually, I mean, generally there is, you know, the idea of a basic minimum wage for all. <clears throat> actually, the research shows that, you know, it isn't a problem. I mean, everybody says get lazy, spend it on drink. I mean, anywhere in the world yeah. I'm talking, not just specific to here. Um, but there's really no proof of that at all. And in fact, there's lots of evidence in the other direction. So um, that's certainly uh, an idea. But I think part of it is using tourism um, as a means to create more conservation areas. I mean, as a proper sort of conservation dry, tourism driver. So that, um, because in these areas, there is very little source of livelihood. It's mostly small farmers. And, you know, the more we suffer climate change, the more difficult their life becomes. And so part of the, their livelihood comes from the forest. I mean, either grazing livestock or using the products from that. Not a very large amount, but then, you know, their livelihood is pretty small. So one can easily find ways to compensate so that um, and increase their livelihood while reducing their dependence and use of the forest. So that can also benefit. Yeah, that is true. And of course, their their dependence on the forest also reduces quite a bit, right? Yeah, it, it's not a huge percent of their livelihood at the moment. So, it, you know, I don't think it's a very difficult to change that. Partly, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, the details, you know, one. Yes. Not <laughs> interesting you. for everybody. But. Yeah, but thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Uh, Anna, I was very um, impressed by this uh, gorilla friendly pledge, you know, um, because one of the things I always believe that the traveler has to go back transformed, you know, uh, he, he needs to get the whole idea of um, and Joanna is with me and we constantly talk about tiger conservation. What, what is the gorilla friendly pledge and do, do a lot of people um, accept it? Do they wear it um, proudly? Yeah, thank you, Shobha. Um, I think for a long time as conservation organizations, we've been fixated, especially when you think about mountain gorillas, but it's it's the same for any other species, tigers or, or sea turtles. You have to respect proximity and make sure that you're attentive to not causing any um, stress on the animal, behavior change, and really important for mountain gorillas because they're they're genetically similar to us is disease transmission. So a lot of our messaging as conservation organizations has been really very rule focused, right? We need people to know the rules. Um, and so the Gorilla Friendly Pledge is trying to shift to really understanding 
better some of the principles behind doing tourism right, um, doing tourism right with, with mountain gorillas. And I think we, um, to where we, we really encourage, you know, self-learning and self-empowered um, decision-making as a consumer as well. Um, and so, yeah, we, we have over probably 20 years made posters of rules and there's distributed rules and train people on how to articulate rules. And that that's not really what responsible or mindful tourism is about. Yes, those are important, but, but it's really about cultivating, um, yeah, that sense of wonder that even if someone is really focused on that photo that they're going to get to take home, um, the opportunities for having something much more meaningful are there. And, and we get that great opportunity and privilege to help, you know, provide depth of experience um, through those. So, you know, when we first tested it, a lot of the reactions are that it actually made people uncomfortable because, you know, if, if they don't follow the rules exactly, they done something wrong. Um, so we're still we're still modifying the language so that way it cultivates yeah more of that pleasure in the experience. Um, so that's a but, but it, to a short question. Yeah, but but we're working right. I mean, it a lot of people do because he. As human beings, I think we are very bad at self-regulation. So I think these little messaging that you give out in where conservation is concerned, it only works. Um, it it kind of um, uh, it kind of uh, you know helps um, have a, a traveler traveler mindset. I mean, it helps change traveler mindset. It it helps change traveler behavior, right? From where they think that. Uh, you know, looking at gorilla, you know, I, you see people whistling at it, calling out to, you know, wild animals. I mean, I, I was just recently somewhere and I was horrified that the guide himself was whistling at the, at the, uh, at a bear, you know. So uh, do you think that it has, you have, it has created impact in, uh, among the travelers? Um, not yet. And I think that's where the pledge in and of itself is yeah. only one part of the more comprehensive certified gorilla friendly approach. So us as a conservation organization and us as a civil society organization, yeah, we need the partners from the private sector. You know, we yeah, need yeah. Um, the government buy-in to really you know, elevate. So even the, the outbound travel agents who, who handle the bookings for a lot of clients as that first first um, uh, point of contact. Contact, um, yeah, yeah. So there's still a lot of awareness. A lot raising. of yeah, 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 yeah. And and getting people on board. And again, it's really exciting to hear about three, you know, private sector entities that are operating as as businesses um, with some foundation work or other work um, associated with it and. You know, those are the voices that when they start to be a critical mass, you reset the parameters for that's really to your credit. So that's exciting. We're, we're yeah. inspired. Yeah, that's uh, it's it's really exciting. But you know, more and more. I mean, I guess the messaging finally will reach the traveler. I mean, there, there's a huge um, in India. We've been uh, there's a responsible tourism society of India, and they've been working on a responsible traveler campaign where you know through videos and through uh, through you know gentle, direct and indirect messaging. We want every traveler, and an Indian traveler is is still evolving, right? So it's 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 a big challenge whether they go into the uh, whether they go into the national park or they're going to a beach or something, littering and things like that are you know are are a big thing. But uh, I think very uh, gentle messaging which can be reinforced, like you rightly said, from the tour operator to the hotelier to the guide, and finally you know and also if the government puts in the uh, the regulations and puts it out as regulations i think eventually the, the tour operator i mean the 
uh, travelers do get it and we can have better and better travelers tra you know going to these places uh, i think we're running out of time and uh, so one of the la one of the last questions i have for you and which is very important i don't know anna we can begin uh, with you if you are uh, if uh, because you're a uh, you're not a I don't think you're a commercial entity, but uh, in your uh, promotion of, uh, there must be a pro promotion for, for gorilla tourism. Do you put these, um, all these, um, um, you know, you know, the regulations or the uh, uh, wildlife friendly, the regulations that you have for gorilla tourism, do you put this out, uh, you know, forward, you put this out up front for when tourists are coming uh, to, to to these uh, places to see the gorillas, do you put it out front or is it a gentle messaging on the side? I mean, you know, because you don't want to scare them off or they might probably start looking to other places to go to or, and is it the same in all these three places that, uh, you know, Rwanda, Uganda, and also Congo is? Yeah, so there's a lot of um, collaboration and actually there's an intergovernmental body that has been established to facilitate uh, collaboration and tourism development. So there's an understanding that, you know, everyone has to be, understanding and abiding by best practices for um, this, these two small populations to continue to exist because they're right along the, the international boundaries. Um, I think the, the messaging um, from the government agencies is quite forward facing about rules and regulations. And from the private sector, you know, it's there um, and, and, and it's varied among the different actors. Um, I think one of the most critically important things that we ask is that the best thing you can do to get the messages across is not put up inappropriate photos and images or have those on your website or, you know, share those on social media, even if it's not yours, even sharing it sets the wrong tone and expectation. So from our point of view, one of the biggest ways we can, we can protect what is the core of a successful mountain gorilla tourism product is making sure all the images represent um, those principles. Yeah, brilliant. Um, Joanna, Husna, and Jamie, y'all are um, hospitality products, right? At the end of the day, that's what you need to be. You need to sell rooms, right? For and it's it's the I won't say it's the backbone of your uh, your conservation story, but it does uh, contribute uh, to you know to the conservation or whatever you've set out to do in the areas. So, do you put out your your conservation uh, ideals and you, do you put out your conservation practices and what you do? as a you know great strategy for marketing and i know joanna and i have spoken about this before that it you don't want it to to look like a commodity but uh, me i i'm a marketing by a person myself and for me to always distinguish uh, the rare group of hotels from everyone else the conservation story is actually a big thing right so how joanna we can begin with you how do you think the conservation story has to be put out so that it doesn't become a commodity through which we are uh, promoting your property, but it's a genuine, um, you know, call out to people and travelers to travel to an area like this so that the, the destination and the community can be impacted positively. That's a very good question, Shobha, and I, um, I'm not sure that I know how to answer it because I think we've We've always been quite wary about putting it forward as a marketing tool because I think that um, you know all these terms sustainable, mindful, regenerative, conservation tourism, you know they they're sort of whipped up by the market and they become they have a whole you know another entity which doesn't necessarily reflect what we think about them. So I guess in a sense we don't actually use that too much, although it is reflected in our um, website to some extent and social media certainly in that we um, you know include things that we're doing through Bowen on our Sarai social media but I think um, you know things will change like Anna was saying that the more that people and I mean the actual travelers and the also the agents that bring them to us um, respect and support mindful tourism um, responsible tourism I think the more the businesses will then 
see it as a business advantage also. So, you know, even if they don't come from a sort of conservation mentality, it will become um, something that they will want to do to keep their businesses up there with everybody else. So it is, you know, I think it is something we do have to talk about. Yeah, 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 and that's the that's the theme of this talk as well about how ecology and economy are interlinked and how they can work in tandem with each other. And Jamie, what do you think? I mean, do you how do you? Uh, you all are younger, you know. You like you said, you're the youngest uh, on the panelist, and I'm sure you must be having a few tricks that you that puts all these ideas out yet does not, <laughs> you know, doesn't make it look like a commodity. Uh, it may seem that way, but it's actually really very difficult to strike a balance between, you know, just wanting to promote and get people on board in becoming responsible and sustainable tourists. But then um, if you will actually look at our social media pages, we have in our website, we have separate ones. Like we have one for the hotel and the resorts. We also have one for the estate, Leo Beach. And then we have one for the sustainability, the environment side, which is ours, Be Green. So yeah. we try to also compartmentalize. And at first it was because it um, it has just been challenging to merge it somehow. Um, without really, like well, as you said, seeming seeming like it's like okay, you have to be this way when you come here, and we are gonna be very strict with you. So we have to balance that with okay, we're here, we'll help you, and all of that. So um, the thing about El Nido, and I think with most of the places that well, your places as well, um, it's very beautiful and it's very easy to attract people. So what we do is we actually put in a lot more efforts um, when they get here, once the guests get here. And we have two ways in which we do that. Uh, we have the hotels that are operating, and then we also have the estate that operates, and we have other businesses within the estate. So for the hotels, um, as mentioned a while ago, we have a lot of engagement with them. And then even if a lot of people say that the customer is always right, we say that if it's about conservation, then we are right because we are backed by science. And yeah. if you say that fish should be fed with bread, then we will say, no, definitely not. And we will stop you <laughs> from doing it. So there's things like that. You have to be soft in some areas, but then also hard in some, some ways. And then for the estate side, for the estate development, since we work with a lot of um, other businesses, other entities, especially other developers who are not very familiar with um, how things are done or should be done sustainably, we try our best to be strict with them in terms of policies. And then we conduct a lot of site visits and audits. And I think for us, it's okay that we're that way because it's the only way that we can really get people to switch into a different mindset. I mean, we have climate change. We have so many things happening right now to us and we cannot afford to like slow down and be uh, to like be very careful and very, um, I, I don't know, afraid of um, getting people in line because time is really of the essence and what we're facing is really urgent and we need to do everything we can to like just get in line. Yeah, very can, right. can I, may I just agree with Jamie about the consumer in, with tourism? The consumer is not always right. I think it's <laughs> one area. Um, and in fact, that sort of quite strongly, I think, should be because we have to lead them to appreciate what it's responsible to provide rather than provide what they think they want. And I think they will they come round to that. You know, yeah. I mean, like the plastic bottle. Everybody told us when we started the hotel, you know, but guests will demand plastic bottles. You can't run a hotel without water bottles, um, bisleri bottles and all. And, but we said, no, we're not going to. And, you know, actually, it's not been a problem at all. And now most people don't expect to get plastic bottles. Um, and that can go into many spheres. So, yes, no, the consumer is not always right. Not always right. <laughs> yes, absolutely, Jamie. Husna, um, Thank you. Yes, um, yes, I ag agree with all those those sentiments, and it's it's interesting for us because um, you see, at the end of the day, we are a tea estate, and a lot of the the community um, sort of stories also link back to the retail model of our selling tea. And people are very concerned about the mistreatment of the bad treatment of workers on tea estates, and the fact that they don't live in good housing, and that you know, the profits just go to the company and, and, you know, you should be certified by fair trade. And, you know, we can't um, 
afford to be certified by fair trade because it costs so much money to be certified by fair trade. So mm. for 20 years, I've always said that you come visit and certify us yourselves. If you come mm. and see what we're doing, then you will automatically want to buy our tea because you can see how happy the people are, how, you know, how they are actually living in, in, in decent homes during yes. COVID when so many migrant workers in India had were homeless and traveling across the country. The workers on tea estates never changed their way of life. They still received their subsidized rations. Nothing happened to their their homes. They were they were still paid. You know, the, the, the estate shut down for I think four weeks, and then they were open again. So they have not been affected, touch wood, at all by the pandemic, and their lives have continued exactly as they were. So, you know, my my philosophy has always been that come and see for yourself, see what we're doing, um, interact with the community, and then you will want to buy our tea because it is it is fair trade in the truest sense of the word and we are certified by the rainforest alliance which we found was a very um interesting organization because it supported both the environment and the community and we got 100 percent in our community relations and our wildlife protection so that was that was really nice and also leading by example and teaching people through practices is something that i didn't really um, understand the impact of until I, I heard it being talked about at um, one of the travel shows that I was attending at the seminar. And um, the speaker was talking about how, for example, if you have a bamboo toothbrush in a bathroom and a family discovers a bamboo toothbrush for the first time, the children may have never seen a bamboo toothbrush. They, they, they may never have even known that they exist and they're, they're only used to plastic toothbrushes. And then while our team to them the value of using a bamboo toothbrush and the, the terrible things that happen to plastic toothbrushes. That's an education in itself. And those children will go home and they will tell their parents, can we now brush our teeth with bamboo toothbrushes? And that little example really um, sort, of, sort of made me realize how just leading by example is a form of education for the uninformed tourist. And it's the same with the plastic water bottles. When we got the confidence to actually invest in our own, sort of, we don't have a huge water treatment plant, but we have you know, RO water that we offer to our guests, 90% of them accepted it very happily. And recently we had an Indian family that came and I got a call from my manager saying that, you know, they want us to use bottled water even for the tea that is going to be boiled in kettles, which is already sterilizing it. And we had actually, we have an all-inclusive package at Glenburn where everything is included. Um, you don't have to ask, you don't pay for anything. It's all part of the full board package. But a couple of years ago, we started charging for packaged mineral water, just a nominal fee as an example to say that it's not that we can't include it, but we want you to realize the cost of us using a plastic bottle um, and the impact it has on the environment. So my manager called me up and said, you know, what should I do? Because, you know, we've just spent two and a half liters on them just boiling mineral water for tea. And I said, that's fine. Just charge them for it. And in doing so, let them realize that, you know, that little bit of extra that they have to pay for, it's not very much, but it's a lesson in sustainability and how they don't really have to do that. So so I think by example, we can... Yeah. And, 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 you know, tourism teaches in that way, you know, and you can learn from good practices in tourism. And to me, that really impacted me, just hearing that speaker talk about how, you know, not changing sheets every day, reusing, you know, um, can actually educate the traveler. And then they take that home and then use those principles in their daily lives. And I think, yeah. to me, that is a great message. And a great That's a great message, message and, a, and, a, and a big part of um, uh, transformation uh, where you talk about my when you talk about mindful travel or regenerative travel i think well thank you ladies it's it was wonderful chatting with all of you and i'm sure that we can we will be there's so much to talk about we need another session but um i'm you know quite intrigued because when i started off i said there are two people talking about community and there'll be two people talking about biodiversity and nature and as you can see both uh, when they were talking about biodiversity nature and conservation they had to they, they were they were there was people, there were people in it, right? And when y'all were talking about uh, communities, there were, there were nature and biodiversity in it. So I guess these two are intrinsically linked with each other. And uh, I hope uh, all our endeavors, and uh, for me as a marketing person, I love taking your stories and telling, to pe telling them to people. And like Husna, you rightly pointed out, um, this also places like yours, um, anywhere in the world, these are also places for small transformations not only while they are traveling, but also in their lifestyle choices that they make. Great. Thanks so much. That's it.
Thank you. Sorry, I wanted to add something. Oh, like, it doesn't ahead. have to be. It doesn't have to be part of the video or anything. No, no, but yeah. jumping off from what Joanna said a while ago and what Krishna said about the staff being compensated and being trained, we also had that similar problem. And you know, there is a percentage that will be lazy when they get paid, that will leave when they get trained. But it's okay because there's always also the other side the percentage and the bigger percentage of people who will actually do something with what they get and transform themselves, transform their lives and transform other people. So we've seen that happen here. We have a lot of staff who started with us a long time ago and then they stayed with, with us also for a long time. And then all of a sudden now they have their own businesses. So it's great yeah. to see them that way. And then when they have their own businesses, they carry with them the practices that they learned from us. Absolutely. So it's very touching to see especially when um, our management teams, it's usually the management teams anyway that tend to like leave and then move on to bigger opportunities. And we saw how they also took everything that they learned from here and tried to apply it into their new um, companies who have never done anything like that before. So even something as simple as bringing coastal cleanups to another area is already a big thing. And really nothing should stop us from compensating people well and training them. Brilliant. Jamie, you are a young heart with an old soul. <laughs> so wonderful. I mean, yeah, that is absolutely right. I mean, and that's a lesson for all of us. When people leave and go, they take a bit of, uh, you know, the bit of what they have learned with them. Yes, I completely agree with you. And many of them come back. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, a lot of them. Yeah, actually, of our big disappointment is that very few of them have gone, have gone. <laughs> train them and they'd move on, but they've all been with us for 10 years. <laughs> just so happy. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thanks, sorry. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much, everyone. Uh, I think I think it's been great. And I think I've probably, I've learned a lot myself yeah, just by listening here. to all of you over the last hour and a half. All of us. And, and the reason, the reason why we actually decided to have this webinar at this point in time as a part of the Natanomics Forum really is that I think we've all realized now that we all live and work in places with very unique biocultural diversities. And the fact that we have these unique biocultural diversities is because we have not really been industrialized. Because I think, I think we have also learned that heavy or uh, common industrialization cannot coexist with biocultural diversities and, and allow biocultural diversities to thrive so the one reason why, why we wanted to get all of you together is to try and connect our sort of entities that kind of work in silos. I think Shobha has, has you know, done a great job in sort of bringing many of these entities together in the Indian subcontinent and our neighbors. But I think it is really time that we get together and sort of create a larger movement. So this, this webinar, I hope, is the first in a series of creating a larger movement and a larger movement, not just in India, but across Bhutan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and actually across the world. So we will actually be, be taking notes from this to start creating policy re recommendations for, for the Indian government, for the government of the various states in India, and then working together with our partners in the Eastern Himalayan zone to come up with a policy recommendation for what a future mindful tourism could look like. Could look and, like. I think that, and I think that COVID has changed a lot of things for the better, for the worse. And, but I think that now is really the time when we must connect all of our actions irrespective of where we are in the world and try and create not only a, a movement to convince our respective governments, but actually to create a good global movement to influence many others. You know, and, and I think that we are sort of like the selected few that, are, that understand and are practicing sustainability, but we owe it to people who are younger, in fact, younger to me as well, younger to all of us, to actually get more and more people on board, you know, on this on this movement. So thank you so very much. That was really an interesting conversation that explored the role of tourism and nurturing a culture, deeply mindful of conservation practices to preserve the natural capital of a particular region. A huge round of applause and thanks to all the panelists.
Well, viewers, now we will be presenting our second session of the day, Reconciling Ecology and Economy, in conversation with renowned economist, Lord Nicholas Stern from Grantham Research Institute of Climate Change and Environment in UK. Thank you so much, Nicholas Stern, for joining us at the Eastern Himalayan Naturonomics Forum 2020. In spite of your very busy schedule, we are honored to have you on board with us. And we would request you to speak to our audience today about, you know, really your thoughts on, on the current and, and, and the unprecedented climate crisis and the, and the very grave consequences that it's having on our immediate future and, and also questioning our survival on this planet. But also, you know, global global targets of meeting net zero by 2050, and how we collectively uh, can create a global movement towards making this happen. Thank you so much for being here, and we really look forward to hearing from you. It's a real pleasure to be involved in the Naturonomics Forum. Um, I've watched what you've been doing over the years, and it's extraordinarily important. Uh, you're in the right place to help the world understand the consequences of its actions and to understand what can be done. But we are on a very dangerous path. We're already at least one degree in average global surface temperature above uh, the benchmark of the uh, end of the 19th century. And we're already seeing around the world the ravages of just one degree in terms of storms and uh, fires and droughts, extreme events of all kinds. And that's what we're seeing now. We are headed on current paths uh, well over three degrees centigrade. We've not been there as a world for perhaps three million years. Much of the snow and ice would have been uh, gone from the Himalayas, from the Arctic. The last time we were at three degrees, so the world uh, sea levels were 10 to 20 meters higher than now. Some areas would become deserts, others would go underwater. Probably southern Europe would become a desert and Bangladesh would be underwater in large part or totally. So these are the kind of stakes that we are playing for. And uh, we have to make the decisions that are going to change this very dangerous path into something much more sensible and attractive. Those decisions must come now, really, because the next 10 or 20 years will be absolutely decisive. In the last 20 years or so, we've, uh, on various estimates, doubled our physical capital per head, and we've taken down our natural capital per head by about 40%. That's the last 20, 25 years. If the next 20, 25 years is anything like that, we'll, we will be beyond some tipping points and points of no return. So the consequences, the risks that are at issue here are immense, and urgency is intense. So, Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. It'd be great uh, if you could sort of, I think, tell us about how how you think uh, just the world, but I think especially the the Eastern Himalayas, because of its indigenous community, sort of face face grave challenges yeah, as they suffer climate change. Yeah. Very good. Let me let me try first to look at what uh, we have to do as a world, and then look more closely yeah. at the Himalayas. If we are to stabilize temperatures, we have to stabilize the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere because it's the rising concentrations that causes the rising temperatures. So stabilizing 
the temperatures means stabilizing the concentrations, and stabilizing the concentration means net zero. That flows into those concentrations have to balance out, they have to be net zero. That is at whatever temperature you stabilize, even if it was three degrees, God forbid, you would have to um, have net zero to stabilize temperatures. The earlier you go to net zero, the lower the temperature at which you stabilize. And for 1.5 degrees, the world should stabilize around 2050, go to net zero around 2050. Some countries a little earlier, some countries a little later, but on average around 2050. And for stabilizing below two degrees, perhaps add 20 years to that, 15 or 20 years. But we know now that two degrees is much more dangerous than 1.5 degrees, and we're already experiencing the dangers of one degree. So we should be going to the world net zero by 2050. How do we get there? Well, we have to look at the very big systems that are associated with the emissions. Our use of energy, the way we move, mobility or transport, number two. Extremely important, the way we use our land, Number three, uh, the way in which land is used for agriculture, for other activities, for forests and so on, and uh, as it is. Those are the four very big systems. They interact, of course. So we have to go uh, net zero right across the board. Some places are going to probably be negative. And if we manage our land well, they could be negative and that could pay uh, in terms of emissions. Very positive, of course, in terms of contribution, but negative in terms of emissions, and that could be very important. So um, we have to push across the world because no one place can do it by itself. But the population around the Himalayas is so big, the countries are so important that they will play a very big part in this whole sto story their energy, their transport, their land, and their cities. But let's look at the Eastern Himalayas in particular, because we know that the big bulk of the population is in farming in some shape or form, and the big bulk of those people are smallholders. So in this case, the management of land and the management of forests is enormously important. And we know that the degrading of land emits uh, greenhouse gases, and the restoration of degraded land captures greenhouse gases. But we also know it's much more than that. Uh, if we deforest, then we know that the hills and the mountains become less stable. So we suffer from landslides, we suffer from loss of biodiversity. We know that the uh, deforestation and the loss of the uh, glaciers and the snows disrupts in a devastating way water flows uh, from off the Himalayas. And we know that billions of people depend on those water flows off the Himalayas. So the management of the land and the forests in that Himalayan region are critical, of course, to the region itself. They're critical to all the rivers that flow off that, uh, but they're also uh, critical, that management of the land to the future of our planet. So there's a sense in which the, um, a crucial sense in which the Eastern Himalayas is at the heart or the nerve center of this whole story. And that's why I follow the Naturenomics uh, gatherings with such uh, enthusiasm. And I wish you the very best of luck for your very important work. Thank you so much, Lotton, for those very inspiring words. Um, what we will be doing from these video messages and interviews is to actually create policy recommendations for the northeastern states of India, but also the greater eastern Himalayan region and the country that belong. And we will be in touch with you uh, sort of on the details of what this net zero policy for the eastern Himalayan region should look like, and the region uh, needs your guidance and expertise to make this happen. Thanks, thanks very much for your time. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure.
Thank you, Lord Nicholas Stern. We would now be presenting a panel discussion towards a new regenerative green economy, challenges and opportunities in association with the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India and the National Mission on Biodiversity and Human Wellbeing. The panelists include Nitin Pandit, Director of A3 India, Nandan Non from Terry School of Advanced Studies India, Rajkamal Goswami, Research Associate at A3 India, Kanchan Chopra, former Director of Institute of Economic Growth in Delhi, Anita Datta, Assistant Professor at Rashtriya Gramin Vikas Nidhi, India. Good morning and good evening everyone and welcome to this special panel discussion on creating a regenerative and green economy at the 8th edition of the Eastern Himalayan Naturenomics Forum, organized by ATRI and the Biodiversity Collaborative for the National Mission on Biodiversity and Human Well-Being, alongside the Balipara Foundation. I would like to thank all the panelists for being here and we look forward to an engaging and lively session. Our panel today brings together an eclectic group of people with experience from years of research and on the ground work with business and communities in this arena. It's so important today as world leaders debate both a green recovery and a great reset in the wake of COVID-19's damage to our collective health, well-being, and economy, and the growing recognition that ecology is the heart of economy. The moderator for tonight's session is Dr. Nitin Pandit, Director of the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and Environment. Previously, he was the Director of Priority Initiatives at the World Resources Institute in Washington, DC, focusing on restoration and energy efficiency after serving as the CEO of WRI India. Before WRI, Dr. Pandit was president of the International Institute for Energy Conservation for implementing novel sustainable energy approaches for developing countries. He has prior experience in consultancy with a specialization in the use of AI in environmental and renewable energy systems. He is joined tonight by Dr. Non, an economist by disciplinary training with a doctoral degree from Jawaharlal Nehru University where he teaches, he teaches the interface of environment development and economics. His present research interests are in ecological economics, environment and development, and environmental economic accounting. Before joining Terry SAS in 2014, he taught in the West Bengal National University of Judicial Sciences since 2001. His works have been published in various journals including the Journal of Agrarian Change, Economic and Political Weekly, and the Journal of Human Development and Capabilities. He has recently co-edited Ecology, Economy, and Society, Essays in Honor of Kanchan Chopra, Global Change Ecosystems and Sustainability, and Economic Challenges for the Contemporary World. He was the Head of Department of Policy Studies at Terry SAS, and Secretary of the Indian Society for Ecological Economics. He has been a recipient of doctoral fellowships from University Grants Commission and the Indian Council of Social Science Research and Fulbright Nehru International Education Administra Administrator Seminar Scholarship, besides being an associate at the Indian Institute of Advanced Study. He is presently the Managing Editor of Ecology, Economy and Society, the NC Journal, a guest co-editor of the Review of Environment and Development in Economic and Political Weekly, and coordinator of the Inter Internal Quality Assurance Cell at Terry SAS. Dr. Kanchan Chopra was formerly director of the Institute of Economic Growth at Delhi University, where she was professor. She has been on the editorial and policy boards of several international journals including environment and development economics and ecological economics, and was senior associate of the Ecological and Environmental Economics Program hosted by the ICTP in Trieste, Italy. 
She was member of the assessment panel of the Millennial Ecosystem Assessment and co-chair of its working group on response options. She is a fellow of the Baicha Institute of Ecological Economics, Stockholm, and of the South Asia Network of Development and Environmental Economics. She was president of the Indian Society for Ecological Economics and president of the Indian Society of Agricultural Economics. Currently, she co-edits Ecology, Economy and Society, the Journal of the Indian Society for Ecological Economics. Dr. Raj Kamal Goswami hails from the remote north from the remote northeastern region of India, where the bulk of India's forests and biodiversity is concentrated. With his efforts, the first protected area of the Gentia Hills was established in 2014. He's also working with local communities to declare some of the last remaining community-owned primary tropical evergreen forests as community reserves, a protected area category under Indian wildlife law. He's also promoting the globally threatened Hulok gibbon as a conservation mascot for the tropical forest of this region, through which he hopes to attract wider conservation attention for their precarious plight. He is hopeful that the nascent ecotourism initiative he helped to kickstart will not only discourage hunting by creating avenues for conservation-friendly income sources, but also save one of the last remaining Hulag Gibbon populations of these hills. Anita Datta is the deputy director of the Rashtriya Gramin Vikas Nidhi, RGVN, where she has been working for 25 years. RGBN focuses on rural livelihoods and financial inclusion, and Anita Datta heads the financial inclusion area, which has partnered with the Crystal Foundation. This, the financial inclusion program has received the President's Award for the Best CSR Project and has positively impacted over 200,000 women. I now turn it over to Dr. Pandit to set the context for today's conversation. Over to you, Dr. Pandit. Thank you, uh, Joanna. Good morning from here in the US, uh, uh, in the east coast of the US, uh, where it's getting a little cooler on the outside, but I believe the political temperatures are rising on the inside. So I think overall, we probably okay. Uh, but be that as it may, it's a pleasure to uh, address uh, this audience and, and be with this uh, super panel uh, that has been put together. Uh, with the help of the Palipara Foundation and in support of the National Mission on Biodiversity and Human Well-Being. The mission was launched uh, with the help of the Principal Scientific Advisor of India, Dr. Vijay Raghavan, uh, over a year ago now. And uh, the idea of the mission was to bring together the best research organizations in India working on biodiversity specifically, and to see how biodiversity plays a role in different uh, segments of society, in different sectors. Therefore, the mission contains uh, six uh, components and an overarching component where all the data are gathered and integrated so that we can look at the analysis where biodiversity plays a role in human well being from several perspectives. Uh, with that as it may, uh, as it is, we uh, I would like to now talk about the current session that we are dealing with today. The title of the session is Towards a New Generative, Regenerative and Green Economy, Challenges and Opportunities. There's a little context to this. Uh, when uh, you look at what the World Bank did uh, in uh, 2014 and before that, uh, it's, uh, I believe the study was called Greening India's Growth. From a larger perspective, uh, the study was a very detailed analysis of what were the damages that are caused in the process of development that we follow. In fact, uh, at that time, when the GDP growth was supposed to be around 8.3%, the study revealed that a staggering 5.7% of it was actually to be negated because it essentially extracted from our environment and in fact is the negative component of that growth. So therefore our net growth uh, increase was actually not as much as what we thought it to be. It's like taking money out of your bank and using it and saying that 
that essentially you're using it for growth during that particular year for some benefits that you might accrue. Therefore, it becomes very important that while uh, we have some tools uh, uh, to measure what our economic growth might be, it is important to see how the green economy can actually be used as a tool to look at a truly regenerative uh, way of uh, living in the future where the quality of life and the environment around us improves as we go along. It is certainly directly in the crosshairs of the National Mission on Biodiversity and Human Wellbeing. Now, so far, economists have given us several tools to measure the market value of nature uh, and uh, to incorporate this in what is called the system of natural accounts. Uh, the monetary value of biodiversity and ecosystem services. Uh, there are several methods to measure this and assess it at global, national, and regional levels. However, in, it, these are not easy issues to deal with, and therefore, in most parts of the world, business as usual has continued, where uh, 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 non-representative measures like the GDP are used to define progress and development, uh, not considering other parts of uh, the environment and the damage and the degradation that uh, it incurs. In most parts of uh, uh, the world, uh, there was a recognition when COVID-19 struck that in fact, there is a very close connection between biodiversity and development in the first place. And in fact, we cannot ignore it anymore. For the first time, public health uh, has, has been prioritized over business, income, and profits at all levels of society, including the individual level, where the improvement of the quality of life, human health and life, has taken front and center stage. In this context, COVID-19 provides us with the opportunity of showcasing the healthy, ethical, and green choices that we must make in response to the growing demand for reimagining our growth and development across nations, corporations, institutions, and individuals. In order to do this, we must change our focus to demonstrating not only the economic value of nature uh, in a traditional sense, to a more intuitive uh, sense where uh, it can lead to policy designs that are more friendly towards our uh, environmental systems, as well as our human systems. But one component of it is in fact the human component and where uh, the, the need to address the socioeconomic needs of humans as a part of the ecosystem needs to be realized. And numeraires, which are not taken into traditional economic uh, analyses, such as employment and gainful employment, uh, and then turnover and income uh, from bioresources. These are, uh, these are typically outside the ambit of traditional economics that we must now not ignore anymore. The value of the co-benefits that are attributable to interventions that take these into account, such as augmentation of the biodiversity, improvement of ecosystem services and public health, the impact of zoonotic diseases, those need to be articulated in a much better and a policy-friendly manner. So with that in mind, I'll bring this my initial remarks to a close and then throw open some questions uh, to the panel uh, who have uh, over their years uh, studied these uh, subjects, but from different perspectives. And what we hope to get in this uh, session are those different perspectives so that we can compare and contrast what options might be available for us for natural capital management moving forward. So with that in mind, uh, let me sort of uh, throw open a, a general question uh, that, uh, that I would then walk through. Uh, first question would be, how can we, broadly speaking, uh, integrate the concept of, uh, of uh, uh, human livelihoods in terms of labor, employment, and jobs uh, with respect to ecology and economy, and that is, how can we better estimate the potential for livelihoods uh, and livelihoods improvement in the uh, sort of a reimagined way of going about in our day-to-day -day lives, whether it's agriculture, 
or, or uh, nature tourism or any other biodiversity based uh, rural, uh, rural livelihoods. So if I can just throw that question out to the panel, maybe I can get a starting point. Uh, Nandan, uh, may I ask you to comment on this? Thank you, Nitin, and thanks to Balipara Foundation uh, and National Biodiversity Mission for organizing this. As we, as we look at this particular question, this question is the core of, I think, uh, today's discussion as to how do we integrate labor or how do we see labor in the ecological economy that uh, two circles or concentric circles. Historically, if we look at it, that uh, almost always it was seen that a rise in the economic system has been at the cost of the lowering of biodiversity. And so there has been seen as kind of a trade-off, and that is how different models have been looked at. Labor has not been seen as any of the way in which these two circles were connected to each other. Later, the recent, recent biodiversity science or sustainability science arguing that look at first from the other side, and that is that look at the increase in biodiversity or ecosystem flows, and that is an essential connection to the economic system. Once again, labor is not there in it. The reason is obvious. The obvious because the most of the benefits that you can look at it, that is collected through the harvesting or gathering, most of it do not reach the market. As a result of it, the economic system ignores this natural resource-based livelihoods. So if you look at it, even agriculture for the matter, it is a natural resource-based livelihood, but uh, poultry income that uh, people make from the agriculture has resulted into crores of earlier farmers or people who used to be farmers earlier are, are leaving that job. The reason, once again, as I said, that it is to do with the fact that there is no recognition from the economic system and in terms of money. Aspirations, on the other hand, due to the due to the revolution that has happened to the communication medium, that cannot be denied. And as a result of which I would say that the way to, way to proceed or for the matter, how do we see it? Recognition of the labor and recognition of the labor happens only through a process of collectivization or collaboration. Amul is a good example in which the labor was rewarded and the rewarded in a sustainable manner. So I would like to see that, I would like to see that the sustainable a bioeconomy based an endeavor, which is a form of a cooperative, good example being Amul, is one way to see that how such labor, natural resource, economic connections can be made. Over to you, Nathan. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that's, uh, that captures it in a very succinct manner, uh, Nandan. Uh, a lovely description. I'd like to sort of dwell a little bit on this. Uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, looking at uh, creating a bioeconomy-based uh, model and where we start looking at uh, sort of the collectivization of, uh, of uh, human and other effort uh, towards a, a model that is more sustainable, uh, can you can you add a little more uh, light on how specific uh, sectors uh, such as uh, agriculture or tourism or others uh, might be able to look at this lens uh, you know that you've provided and that in fact uh, you've mentioned Amul in particular. But does that model apply across all these sectors and and how does one think through that process? Uh, if you look at it, that the biggest challenge or so far as recognition of labor in the economic system is concerned about the smallness of the entrepreneurs or for that matter, those who are willing to provide labor. That smallness was addressed in the Amul model. For a long time, there are two that are very recent times, the farm bill is supposed to address that particular channel, challenge of smallness. That is that small farmers or small producers of non-timber forest products, even India's agroforestry policy also allows us cultivation. But somehow or the other, that is not happening. Government of India is trying to provide subsidies to create farm producer organization. So there are changes that are happening on the ground, but one is not sure whether Amul can be replicated because there are powerful interests also, which will be able to make monetary gains out of the surplus generated 
by the uh, by the by the poorly paid laborers and nature so so there were discussions but i believe that collectivization is an essential requirement of this fpos is one but at the same point of time looking at how this money or the income can be realized by generating a sustained demand by looking at the demand question i think this is something these are the these are the these are the churning point there are uh, i'd say the churning seeds already there on the one hand aspiration on the other hand that the fact that rural areas covid 19 is a good example that covid has resulted in reverse migration so so the rural areas have to generate their sustained employment and industrialization is not happening so what is the way out i think this is a, this is something that is uh, that is already in place okay i see so so one of the things that and the reason obviously i asked the question was whether in fact that model becomes replicable and in fact can be replicated uh, across uh, different uh, sectors uh, let me take that question over to uh, anita if i could for a second um you know there are uh, a lot of these uh, um, solutions uh, such as uh, Uh, amul and other collectivization uh, solutions that uh, have been proposed some of them experimented with and like amul some of them in in large scale uh, operation through aggregation in a in a very thoughtful way the question becomes these are solutions uh, but uh, nandan just mentioned about demand is this a solution looking for a, for demand or is there demand and is that a reason why Uh, we may or may not be seeing sort of the kind of equitable growth that we need to see in in a green economy at at the ground level and i know you've been involved in sort of financial inclusion at the ground level and i'm wondering if 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 uh, the 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 replicability of that model faces any challenges as you start implementing it Uh, thank you so much uh, dr pandit and thank you bali para foundation for having me today now uh, you see i'm not a scientist and i cannot speak of any technology but i work very close to people i work you know basically with people's minds and hearts and hurts mm-hmm. and i try to understand and listen to their problems you see when you are working with 200000 women you know and you keep getting data on them feedback on them you try to listen to what they have to say what is it that they are saying you know do do they like this idea of collectivization are they going to work towards it now you see there's a lot of pressure on us also as ngo people as field workers that we have to go in for collectivization okay and you see in assam in a place like assam where i am working the northeast assam the self help group movement has become pretty strong okay there are many self help groups and uh, the assam state rural livelihood mission is really taking them forward okay though they are 10 member groups it is not difficult to collectivize a particular livelihood okay of course you know amul okay amul this cooperative called amul it is you know beyond imagination that it has worked so well but uh, of course other amul mo- models have also worked very well in the field of you know milk milk supply milk chains okay now but when we are talking about farmers producers organizations you see nabard and governmental institutions are pressurizing us that you go in for fpos you know and i work in a ngo so what happens in a ngo you look for uh, things which you know give you benefits and also provide finance for doing so okay because financing is a very difficult area especially in northeast okay it's very difficult it's very difficult to get finance so we have started looking at government models you know the fpo farmer producers organizations and how do we set it up i think this is collectivization is an answer and we are not only thinking of fpos but we are also thinking of 
of farm uh, producers organizations, OFPOs, okay? Recently, we have started a silk, you know, a airy silk project. And though we start, you know, it's very organic, it's very close to people's hearts, and it is also a cultural, you know, livelihood here. So what happens is we have, we think that it is perhaps going to work very well. It will work, you know, because then you, you are able to get a fair prize. You know, farmers together, producers together are able to look for markets, explore markets, look for hand-holding, et cetera. And uh, they should be able to also get it, okay? So, you know, when there's one self-help group or five self-help groups, nobody looks at them, okay? But if there are 10 or 20 self-help groups coming together for a particular livelihood, you know, it is going to be the future. But of course, presently what is happening is, you know, self-help groups, it is very difficult to get them to do a group activity. But now we have started because we know that this is the way out. This is how they can bargain for their rights. This is how they can, you know, get the maximum out of the schemes which are available. Okay. And uh, so I think, I think this will work out. That way I'm, uh, I'm with uh, Dr. Nithi, uh, Nandan. And I think that what you have said is a good thing, that this is the way out. We can look at the future, you know, as far as this is concerned, okay? Mm -hmm. And, okay, now we, we are field workers, okay, working with self-help groups. Now we hear of the government's green economic policy and generation of green jobs, okay? But the thing is, you're talking at a macro level. How do you connect it with the micro level? How do you ensure that people at the grassroots are trained, they have the requisite skill sets to take up this and to move forward, okay? This is something which we got to integrate before you know, we move on. So I think that is what I would like to say about this. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Now, let me let me uh, tease that question a little bit further on this. Uh, uh, the, the, we'll come to the skill sets part uh, as we as we go along and about between the macro and the micro. But uh, just dwelling on that question of the, the collectivization and, and so on, the efforts uh, in the cooperative sector as well as for FPOs uh, has been a collectivization of the producers. Uh, so they are still on the supply side of the chain in some sense. The question is, is there demand? Okay. I mean, what is, how, how does collectivization occur on the demand side? And is your experience with SHGs, which are different from FPOs, okay, is the collectivization of SHGs the answer towards generation of the kind of demand that you want to see? And is there an institutional difference between those that needs to be highlighted that perhaps is not as visible to the folks who are not as deeply engaged at the ground level as you are. Yeah, here I would uh, you know, like to tell you that first of all, the cooperative movement, okay, it has failed miserably in many parts of the country. Okay, the, the uh, Northeast being one because it has so much of government interference in this. Mm -hmm. So, that's why, that's why you see the whole uh, farmer producers organizations, okay, the farmer producer organizations or the off-farm producers organizations that has come up as an alternative, okay. I would not even call it an extension of the cooperative movement, but it is an alternative, okay, mm -hmm. because there are various ways in which the power, powers are now going to be vested in the in the in the uh, farmers producers organizations not in any government machinery who is going to interfere with them mm -hmm. i think this is a very important change when you look at it now going to your uh, 
uh, going to your question about SHGs and you see SHG is a manner of collectivization. Okay, you have 10, 12, 15 members learning to work together. But in many of the areas where I work, I have also set up clusters. Okay, where many SHGs can come together. Okay, people like in Assam, I'm just telling you because this is the area where I have expertise in the Northeast. You know, women are skill weavers. Mm -hmm. If they come together and pool in their resources, pool in their talent, their skill sets, their traditional knowledge. Okay, so this is how a uh, of farmers producers organization can be formed. This is the transition from the cooperative. Okay, first of all, the change between the cooperative and the FPOs and also how self-help groups can lead to collectivization in a large way, mm -hmm. okay? okay? Now, regarding your supply and demand chain, okay? The supply chain is nowhere developed, okay? It is still in its infancy, okay? There are, there are people, there are farmers, markets, etc. but it is still in a very, I mean, I would say it's in a very kind of um, early stage, okay? So we have to think of, a, of many ways on how we can, you know, talk about the supply, how we can increase the supply, and also talk about the green methods of agriculture to use all this. And then the demand, okay? We feel that demand is there, but it is supply that does not match the demand. And what happens is that, you know, even, even the demand, okay, even the demand, it has to be put together. It also has to be collectivized. It has to be through some proper channels. Okay, then we can take it forward in a better way. Okay, very good. Let me, uh, uh, you know, you've talked about this, these experiences, both, uh, uh, you know, yourself and, and Nandan. Let me ask Kanchan about this. Uh, you know, uh, when you look at sort of the history of such interventions, and when you look at the instruments that have been utilized and the incentives to facilitate the move towards a green economy, uh, what does that tell us about the institutional arrangements that may be required to move forward so that we these interventions can be can be effective what what does experience tell us about this so far thank you thank you london for bringing me into this and thanks to the balpara foundation for inviting me uh, as i listened to london and to anita i was taken back to the decades of uh, Indian experience in the context of the association between the micro and the macro. Because we have a large number of such, uh, uh, we have a large number of uh, uh, experiments on the ground starting from the 80s and the 90s when we had participation and decentralization as the focus. And I remember in Rajasthan, the, in, around Udaipur, a large number of these experimentations going on, also elsewhere in the country. But we need a link. We need a link between the macro and the micro so that micro experiments can do well. Many a time what happened, especially in the case of an experiment documented by Kishore Sen in uh, Rajasthan, that the micro experiment was going on very well. And law, the law from the center prevented it from So we need a kind of uh, a kind of work on the ground. If macro policy 
Institutes and uh, institutes, they are not vision of the collectivization or participation, especially in areas like watershed management, will not happen if we have uh, policies from the center which do not support such things. Now, I'll take a little time to look at the policies from the center which had been coming up reasonably well in the 90s and the first decade of the century in order to support such ground level initiatives. Long ago, there was a small notification in 1990, which helped in bringing about joint forest management. Following that watershed guidelines in 1992, which helped in improving in replicating the watershed uh, participatory experience in many parts of the country with varying degrees of success. I'll not say it was a success everywhere, but with varying degrees of success. And there is a way in which some of our workings on the ground in a way appropriate the best kind of institutions. So we need to have work at the ground level, work from the grassroots, so to say, which helps us to see where the mistakes in policy are. But policy has also to move in a certain direction. I'd like to draw attention National environment. Mm -hmm. I think we're losing you quite a bit. Stakeholders in uh, society. Is, is, is that, uh, am, I am I not audible? Oh my. Uh, yeah, is it better now, Nitin? Is it uh, okay? A little better, Kanchan. We lost a little bit of uh, what you said uh, for about one minute or so. Uh, I was just drawing attention to the uh, environmental policy of 2006, which was run up with extensive interactions with the grassroots organizations with interactions with I. Yes. Uh, some were option. We had the Forest Rights Act. We had the many other things, even the information, the right to information played a huge role in helping people to bring all issues to the forefront, to the social media and to the media. My essential point is that we need to have a link between uh, experiments at the ground, at the grassroots level, these collectivization and other experiments need to feed back into the macro level policy and they need to be supported by macro level policy, a kind of two-way interaction is what is needed. But we are a long distance from that. We know uh, that uh, there is two, we take two steps forward and one step backward. When we look at the environmental impact assessment, which is actually the practical part of government policy had good movements for the environment circulated in 2020 is actually going two steps backward. And I will not go into the details of that. It does not really look at the, what we learn from the grassroots experiments. It only tries to uh, choose speed of implementation of projects. It tries to choose 
peace at the cost of religion. We want to get development projects done. There are two lobbies always at work in the context of policy. There is the so-called development lobby, environmental lobby, and these need to be to see that development is about the environment, and that is where we need to work together. We need to work both from the academics, from the workers on the at the grassroots levels, the different experiments, replication of these experiments. It's a huge journey. In a democracy, I feel the right to information, the social media plays a very important role, and we need to bring all these things into the, bring a kind of feedback to micro. There are statements of the solar energy thing, the consortium that we have, the international statements made in international uh, agencies and international forums. But then, again, there is a certain understanding that in the short run, we need more jobs, we need more growth, and therefore, we need more projects and we forget about the green economy. Now, how do we bring these two together? That is the challenge. I'll stop here and come back if there is anything else that I can contribute to this discussion. Uh, at the moment, I'll stop here. Thank uh, you, Nitin. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kanchan. That's a, that's a very quick uh, 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 overview of of the rich history of some of the the things that have worked and things that are that still need to work uh, and it sort of brings me you know to uh, one of my uh, uh, teachers and mentors Lynn Ostrom who would have talked oh. about uh, different <laughs> kinds of institutional <laughs> arrangements uh, that would be needed what she referred to as nested institutions uh, I know, I know, I know. Institutions at local and landscape levels and all the way aggregating into policy. But the process to, re yeah. to reach that is, is still uh, a long drawn process and, and it will probably take some time uh, before we reach there. But in fact, are there any uh, examples, uh, you know, where uh, uh, something like this can happen? I mean, Nandan and, and uh, Anita talked about uh, you know, Amul as being an example. And uh, policy intervention that is now proposed uh, through the FPOs as an intervention that uh, that uh, one might look at. From your experience, Kanchan, have you uh, thought about an, or have you uh, any uh, history of interventions that we can still look at, which might give us uh, an inkling as to how these nested institutions might be made to work uh, in, in our context here? Uh, the closest I can think of, I won't call it a nested institution, but it is a scaling up. It is the watershed uh, program, which has seen movement from individual experiments to a policy and then to replication. Replication in Madhya Pradesh, replication in Andhra Pradesh, maybe the new Telangana and Andhra Pradesh with that area, and Orissa. But of course, some people would say that JFM, uh, uh, but I'm talking of watershed management here. And it has seen a coming back in the Nurega programs again. So if you look through uh, from the 90s to the Nurega program, 80s, we had only Sukhmajiri, Ralegaon Siddhi, and so on. 90s, we had watershed guidelines and some states doing it 
in Madhya Pradesh, Urisa, and maybe in uh, Andhra Pradesh, and then Narega, where you have uh, soil conservation, watershed de development as a part of the uh, Narega now. And of course, that is where jobs also come in, rural jobs are also created. Someone needs to look at this. What is the job creation potential of some of these programs? Long ago, one of my students did it, uh, but I've forgotten what she found out. <laughs> <laughs> well, we must refer to that. In fact, I suspect uh, that uh, Raj Kamal would probably want to look at that research since uh, I believe, Raj, uh, you're looking at an example where, uh, uh, you know, one would need to look at all these mechanisms, whether it's Narega, whether it's uh, the FPO's policies and so on, and where some of this can come together into, uh, you might say, institutional or policy design that would help in the, in the, in the, uh, in the area of uh, growth of jobs, uh, as well as uh, sort of uh, conservation and, and restoration of, uh, of biodiversity. Maybe you can speak to us about that and share some of your experiences and we would then go around and ask for others to opine on, on what you are working on right now. Thanks, uh, Nitin, uh, for your wonderful moderation and also thanks to Balipara and the National Mission on Biodiversity for organizing this uh, brilliant uh, panel. I personally feel very privileged to be part of this very elite uh, set of thinkers uh, from around the world today talking about one very important issue. And so far, um, the issues raised by all the panelists um, and the moderator has been very, very uh, insightful and has teased out many of the things that we have been thinking about. So uh, what Nitin is referring to is a recent um, uh, analysis that we did, which will feed into uh, one of the special issues that uh, is being edited, in fact, by Nandan, apart from uh, uh, a set of other co-editors, which is basically looking at the uh, pathways and the potential of different interventions which can feed into the green economy, but particularly in the uh, aftermath of COVID-19. So, uh, like Kanchan, Cho, uh, Kanchan uh, correctly mentioned, there's a long history of uh, the idea of green economy being floated, how it feeds into with the existing institutions at both uh, micro and macro level, how, how we uh, need to connect these two. But uh, in my experience and what we all have seen is still COVID-19 struck, uh, most of this has been um, at the realm of discussions and uh, um, while there has been some kind of interventions being uh, looked at from the perspective of uh, feeding into the, the demand part of it. So for example, employment, but it was never tried, there was never an implicit or explicit um, uh, like intention or um, uh, some kind of uh, the policy directive was not there to link it to the green uh, or how to design a green economy around the question of employment, for example, which has been plaguing a developing economy like India for a long time. Uh, so with that uh, question in mind, what we tried to see uh, was uh, we took the uh, recent flashpoint of the huge reverse migration that we saw uh, and we also uh, was aware that we were aware uh, that uh, the village economy is not in, not in a very gr a great shape, the rural economy, uh, so to say, both the production as well as the non-farm uh, parts of the rural economy. So the huge uh, reverse migration that we see, apart from uh, the Enrega initiative, which is also uh, has uh, come to be underfunded in the recent years, how do we absorb this uh, huge demand of employment that is going to be uh, uh, like generated in the rural uh, uh, landscape? And there we felt that um, the issue of uh, restoration, which has been going on uh, for many decades in the um, in the realm of ecology, 
looking at how you can ecologically uh, and sustainably restore landscape, which will not just increase the productivity uh, of the landscape, the, but it will also improve the biodiversity and the biodiversity-based livelihoods of the uh, landscape. And uh, from the ecologist perspective, we see uh, employment and um, and the uh, improvement in the farm productivity as co benefits but um, because we are in atri and we always uh, try to look from alternative perspectives uh, even though my specialization is uh, from a very biodiversity and ecology based uh, research for this particular paper we turned the lens and we started looking at the employment potential and uh, rural landscape regeneration as time benefits and started looking at biodiversity and uh, other benefits as co-benefits so as to have a better uh, dialogue with the policymakers that we were trying to directly address uh, through this paper and what we found was um, the land available according to the official statistics uh, of the government of india uh, which we also looked at critically and not just took, up, took the entire atlas because we saw certain loopholes and certain um, uh, certain uh, lacunae there uh, in the way they had framed some of the categories of uh, wastelands. Uh, so we found that there is a nice uh, uh, congruence between the uh, area that is currently available, an underestimated uh, area that is currently available for landscape uh, restoration which is roughly around 29 million hectares, uh, which kind of uh, uh, matches the 26 million hectares that India has pledged as part of the bond challenge, uh, which seeks to re restore uh, uh, like about 50% of the degraded landscape across the world as part of the UNDP initiative. And it will uh, actually employ uh, about, uh, to the tune of about 1,058 million labor days. And uh, the, the, the amount of money that will be required is almost equal to the increment that the government of India has allotted uh, on top of the annual budget uh, for Manrega initiative, the, the Rural Employment Guarantee Act uh, initiative. So, uh, so this paper, should uh, um, be accepted, uh, I feel, uh, very soon. We'll get a final uh, de decision on on the from the editors on this. But I think the the kind of um, so our main focus was to um, bridge that gap. What Kanchan and Anita was talking about uh, between the macro policies and the demand and the micro scale, uh, both in terms of demand for employment, uh, demand for better farm productivity, demand for non-farm employment, and in the rural sector, all these things are linked. So if you have better farm productivity, even the non-farm rural uh, economy boosts up. And uh, with the, with, if, if there is the improvement in the biodiversity, uh, there is a huge uh, boost to the bioresource-based livelihoods, what uh, Nandan was talking about broadly in the sphere of bioeconomy, which is not entirely dependent on the um, on the on the um, like agricultural produce uh, uh, economy. So this is very briefly what we tried to do, and one of the main intention was to bridge the gap between the macro policy mm -hmm. uh, and the micro demand. So this is uh, actually quite fascinating because as as one sees it, uh, here's an opportunity and, and this panel was to talk about challenges which we have and, and the opportunities that exist. But the opportunity, broadly speaking, is not only in sort of the area of restoration, which pro, which which is a is a is a smaller opportunity unto itself, because it allows us to to experiment with the process of building, uh, uh, designing, and creating institutions, which are sort of nested, or you might say at different levels, where it actually can add up to a policy instrument that can hopefully make sense. But at what it does do is enable us to go through the process of doing that, which is what Kanchan was saying. It doesn't yet exist in terms of connecting the macro to the micro policy 
and the implementation on the ground. So potentially, uh, you know, in doing so, ultimately at the end of the day, I just saw a quote um, uh, from our uh, Honorable Prime Minister the other day, uh, where uh, the 26 million hectares was discussed as a part of our commitment to the bond challenge, as well as to the UNCCD in terms of uh, this thing. So it's a there are many things coming together on that. There is also our uh, NDC3 under the carbon sequestration requirement to the Paris Agreement, where it plays into. So restoration plays a, a substantial role in all these commitments that we have at a global scale and then therefore at a national scale. But the question is, what are the institutional requirements needed so that on the ground changes can actually add up to those policy impacts that, uh, that we want to see? Uh, I think this is a this feels like a a tremendous opportunity for everyone to sort of uh, uh, work on and and see how in fact we can interject other mechanisms whether they are in our experience with building cooperatives and FPOs and and creating collectives and aggregations of them, but also in in bringing together what uh, what Anita was speaking about which is how do you bring skills development into this process? Because a substantial amount of skill development will need to be done. How do institutions like NSDC and others play a role in this process? How do we bring Manrega uh, funds to support this in addition to other funds that are there, you know, uh, what should I say, a, a disparate fashion all across the government, whether it's CAMPA, whether uh, there are any state funds, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, any commentary on 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 what this opportunity might uh, provide uh, us in sort of trying to restore our lands, especially if we're using ecological restoration to build back the biodiversity and a bioresource based uh, economy. Let me go for a last round on this one question for everyone, one by one, mm -hmm. starting. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I missed your quick. I'm sorry, I missed the question. <laughs> the the uh, question, listen. yeah, the question was that given that this is an opportunity that brings a lot of these toge uh, issues together and where one can look at the, uh, the process of connecting the micro and the macro uh, policies uh, uh, and to bring together the different types of funding that uh, can be made available, whether it's in skills development or in uh, uh, in uh, uh, CAMPA types of funds or any state funds and so on, how does one think about institutional design as we go forward towards the, the such a green uh, economy? As an example, I throw it out as a question. There could be other examples, but this is one of them. Uh, starting with Nandan, and I'll we'll go through one round, and I think at that time we'll probably come to the close of our session. Uh, Nitin, uh, my, in my experience of the bioeconomic programs of in the recent times, one has seen a transition, and that is from the skill development to entrepreneurship development. So the subsidy has been given to the group of people and coming up with equipment, be it the equipment or be it something else, but there has been a transition that has happened. So the, we have moved away from the skill formation to entrepreneurship formation. And on the other hand, uh, the institutions or institutional subsidies given to group of people, for example, uh, bee, beehive or rather honey honey producers collaborative. I think I think one has to one has to the other other reading of the literature on these bioeconomic programs in the last twenty years time. It also showcases that the success of such intervention has been higher in case such intervention with leverage with an existing one. For example, if MNREGA can be reimagined, it is already within the scope, the ecological restoration is definitely within the scope. But in case it is foregrounded, MNREGA already has a nationwide institutional setup present, how engineers is to evaluate and everything is present. It's a question of tweaking the scope a little bit, pushing forward, given that United Nations have already declared the next decade as a decade of ecological restoration, I think there is a case of making ecological restoration enable livelihoods as a result of bioeconomy. On the other hand, FPOs and other, other institutional incentives are going to be carried out. I'll stop here.
Very good. Very succinct. Thank you, Nandan. Anita? Yeah, I just, uh, I would like to reiterate that there has to be synergy at all levels. You know, sometimes I get this feeling that we have a lot of resource, but we are all working on our own. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that there has to be a bottoms up approach, not a top, top down approach. I think it is extremely important to have a bottoms up approach to hear the voices of the people who actually need, you know, these kind of policies. And you have to hear them from the grassroots. That is the most important part of it. And you see, we have such successful Panchayati Raj institutions. Okay, we have panchayats in every village. Involve them, let them understand, evolve them, involve and evolve them. Let us let them understand the changes that are required, you know. And from, from the grassroots, you move upwards and then make your policies. Okay. And you see, uh, I was working on financial inclusion. And let me tell you, during the COVID times, okay, so many people were coming back to the villages. I work in 800 villages. Okay, so there was data on people coming back, how many people were able to access all these schemes which the government had given, okay, which was uh, giving, giving through the different schemes, you know, PM Kisan, Ujala, then MN Rega. Okay, and this whole uh, study at that time also brought to light the different uh, kinds of corruption at whatever level. And also the fact that most of the people, they are not included, they're not financially included. They don't have their papers in order. The bank accounts are all dormant. Okay, so you are trying to give them benefit of some national schemes, but let them learn to, you know, to get everything in order so that they can access their rights and entitlements. That was something which I really felt. And here we are talking about, you know, that there, there is a difference between jobs and entrepreneurship. Okay. We are talking about jobs. Jobs is something else from entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is something which you have a passion for. But are we actually, you know, are we actually um, pairing the skill sets of people? Okay, are we looking at what their passion is and then giving them the skills to achieve that? I think that's where this whole NSDC thing has gone wrong. I just get this feeling. Okay, because I myself have got so many guys to do hospitality management. They go there. They stay for two months and they say, no, I can't do it. And they all just come back. So where are we? These are some of the few questions. And I feel there has to be, you know, very good synergy. There has to be very good pilot projects. The universities have to be involved. And then we can move forward. That's what I would like to say. Thank you. Wonderful. Such a lovely example on that hospitality sector. Kanchan, uh, uh -huh. can you reflect on this? Uh, I was thinking about it, and within there are two things we can do. The institutional part has to evolve, and I completely agree with Anita that we start from it's a bottoms up approach that is needed, but a bottoms up approach alone will not suffice because it may be brought by a sudden polyvents the whole uh, thing from actually flourishing and getting replicated as it should. So you need a kind of, I'd again go back to uh, to and fro between a bottoms up and a tops down approach a kind of to and fro that would be required. Very difficult to achieve in practice, but within the current situation, if one trying, one is trying to look at what will work, uh, I was thinking of uh, agriculture and biodiversity. 
agriculture is the closest to the kinds of sectors where uh, resources, biodiversity are important. As one way of saying that. And within agriculture, we have sustainable agriculture, organic agriculture, and other interventions such as water, uh, things that will uh, save water and so on. All these initiatives have a, have a job or an employment aspect, and they also have a productivity aspect. We need to combine these together, even within the existing private-owned uh, agriculture, privately-owned land. We can have sustainable agriculture. We can simultaneously try for collective. If it doesn't work, we can try for what... Uh, the other day I was hearing a talk by Ace Maglu and he was talking of reinstating technology. And reinstating technology meant technology that brings people back into the center of things, that brings jobs back. And that kind of technology, which is not only about automation, but is about people and about bringing them back into the center of whatever change we are thinking of especially in the context of biodiversity and agriculture, when you have uh, organic agriculture, when you link uh, what is ca called within the agricultural economics, they like to think of it as crop diversification. Crop diversification and activity diversification, livelihoods, which are based on uh, livestock, as well as agriculture, it has been done all the uh, all the time, but no one has really focused attention on it as a kind of mix of dividing your uh, risk agriculture and other activities linked to agriculture. Those are also the kinds of things that we can look at for increasing or doubling farm income as the government uh, talks about it. We can think of those activities that enter new technology within the existing institutions that creates more jobs and is closely linked to the bioeconomy. That's all I'd like to say at the moment. Thank you. Otherwise, Thank I'll go into too much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kanchan. I'm sure a lot of uh, the audience would probably call you back on this. Raj, I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes to uh, close off on this because I think we'll otherwise run past time. Uh, so if you can give a quick uh, view on this and then I'll just give some closing words. Yeah, I think... Uh, um, I mean, most of the panelists have uh, nicely summarized uh, some of the gaps that exist in the institutional and the uh, gap between the macro and the uh, macro policies and the micro demands. Uh, and we always talk about top and bottom, but I think we academicians, uh, which I feel we occupy the middle part, who can forge dialogue with both the uh, policy makers, as well as connect with the grassroots because of our inherent interest in the research aspect of it, uh, we, we are set to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, play a very important role in this. And uh, uh, we also need to see how we can institutionalize the role that academics and researchers can play, particularly in ensuring that the goals that we set um, from the uh, from the grassroots, like what demands do grassroots people have, and what kind of um, uh, targets or um, or the economic um, goals that is uh, targeted by policies, how to bridge this to? Uh, I think uh, I would just like to emphasize on this, and we need to think more about it. How how to institutionalize and how to how what role that we can play. For example, when we talk about restoration. Uh, 
the goals of restoration uh, becomes really really important and that uh, we can play a very important role in monitoring those goals whether those goals are being met or not otherwise it will just become another uh, uh, flat policy uh, employment program without realizing the core benefits of restoration for example very good well, thank you. Thank you so much. What a uh, great panel. Uh, uh, very engaging uh, discussion. Uh, I think that uh, they, it always appears as if when we get into something really interesting, that's we, when we have to call off time. And, uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, we have to uh, bring that to a close. Uh, but it does mean that uh, certainly the mission and, and Balipara Foundation are uh, encouraged to have... Uh, uh, some more sessions like this, we, I'm sure, as panelists and as moderator, would like to engage further on these topics. We're just beginning to actually dive into where the meaty issues are, the tricky issues are, and we just sort of teased uh, the appetite of uh, the listeners and ourselves uh, to, to delve into that point. So I must uh, uh, have you, uh, the listeners, uh, Wait there with bated breath for uh, for further deliberations on this point. Uh, Joanna, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Pandit, for guiding this session, and thank you, uh, Dr. Nandan Nan, Dr. Kanchan Chopra, uh, Dr. Rajkumar Goswami, Anita, for joining us tonight. Your insights on how green employment can be catalyzed in India offer a thought-provoking pathway for future action in the Eastern Himalayan region. We're honored you could join us. And as Dr. Pandit says, we hope this conversation will continue. And we hope to be in touch with you to continue that. And we look forward to driving the nature positive action agenda alongside you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was really an insightful discussion on what the future bears for a regenerative economy. Thanks to all our panelists. Viewers, now we will take a short break and we'll be back after a few minutes. Join us at 30 p.m. See you all then.
Welcome back, viewers. You are tuned into virtual eighth edition of Eastern Himalayan Nature Nomics Forum 2020. Let's start our next session. Role of global conservation diplomacy in realizing natural capital values. The panelists include Pradeep Banerjee, advisor to Hindustan Unilever Limited, India. Vivek Saxena, country representative of IUCN India. Ankur Gupta, general manager, Middle East and North Africa, Tata Sons and Private Limited. So thank you so much for being with us today and talking about a very pertinent issue related to uh, ecological degradation and of course uh, the economy at large. So my first question to you is, uh, why and how should ecology be centered as a foundational element of economic development, uh, particularly in the Eastern Himalayan region, because we are nature capital rich, uh, but in terms of GDP, uh, the region seems to be uh, lagging behind in comparison to, um, to its neighboring uh, countries or states. So your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for... Uh making me a part of this, uh, which I believe is a very rich discussion. I think it's a very topical discussion and it's on top of everybody's mind. Uh, what goes in my mind when, when you talk about, you know, the subject matters which the foundation talks so uh, passionately about, about rural futures, about building local natural capital, about the resilience of uh, forest French communities, livelihoods in, that restore natural capital. But if you were to step back from all of this, this move from a non, from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy is actually a global, global issue today. Uh, it is as relevant for uh, India, uh, even more so for some parts of India, and clearly Eastern Himalayas is a part of that. The, the region which we uh, love is a part of that. So anything which we do uh, cannot be seen in isolation. And I, in my uh, simple way of looking, there is a framework which we need to always keep in mind, which helps. Uh, looking at our issues in Eastern Himalaya in context of where we stand today. Uh, and uh, to me, we are reaching a tipping point whether when, where we, unless we talk about the larger picture uh, and see that picture with some clarity, uh, we will not be able to zoom into the pixel, which is the uh, uh, Eastern Himalayan region. Uh, and therefore, the ongoing economic development, the consequent improvement in quality of life of all of us. We have seen it from the times of industrial revolution. It will continue. Uh, and uh, by any stretch of imagination, I do not come from a point of view of turning back the clock. I do believe that people should be uh, benefiting from the advances in technology, medicines, uh, economy, and, and the like. But the, 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 the definition of businesses going forward, the definition, definition of the development going forward would be very different from what we have seen so far. And to me, that's the discussion we need to be having because that is uh, that is what will impact uh, Eastern Himalayan region. That is what will impact uh, the country. If I dare say, that's the, probably the most uh, burning issue the planet has today. So I'll pause there and uh, then, depending on which direction you want to take, go a little bit. Absolutely, sir. I completely agree with you. And on, on that note of changing definitions and paradigms when it comes to businesses or whether it is uh, an enterprise or whether it is conservation amalgamated together, I think the second question comes in really well uh, in terms of the big risks and challenges uh, that businesses are facing now in terms of ecological uh, de uh, degradation, um, which is accelerating in India today. Um, how do we sort of build back better to overcome these challenges, sir? Very clearly, if you, uh, and, and, a, and, and a pertinent question, because it goes back to the heart of uh, the economic model, which we have practiced for a few generations now. And, and if truth be told, uh, it has given, uh, given results. We have seen continuous improvement in the quality of our lives over uh, the last, uh, from the times of industrial revolution, as I said. Uh, but the tipping point now is very clear. And if I look ahead, clearly the what has made us successful so far uh, will not work for the model for in years to come. Uh, put in very simple terms, uh, what I uh, described so far, we have more followed a 3G model of growth. Growth which is uh, consistent, 
growth which is competitive uh, and, and growth which is profitable. These have been the three pillars on which our traditional economic models have been set. And, and, and there was a point of view that if you do these three things well, the world will take care of itself. And, and so far, maybe it was. But I think the fourth dimension is getting added on to this with clarity, uh, with uh, absolute uh, integrity with the complete business model, which to me is the responsible element. So the businesses have, of course, has got to follow the three C's, which I, uh, the three, uh, the growth uh, description, which I gave, but it also has to be responsible. So of course, it has got to be profitable. It's got to be consistent. It's got to be competitive and it has got to be responsible. And what are the elements of responsibility? It is in the area of uh, the impact we have on this planet. The impact we have in this, this total extractive economy, which we talked a few uh, minutes ago, that the time for that is gone. And you can see it in so many ways. If you see some of the mega trends today, you see the way populations are increasing. What has taken us, uh, what used to take, the first couple of billions were reached over a period of decades. And now we are looking at going from where we are to 10 billion over the next few years. So the acceleration of population, the acceleration of mobility, the acceleration of technology, the acceleration of the, the, the capital, and all are moving in an increasingly faster manner, which also means that the trust in large businesses, the trust in governments, the trust in many of the institutions which have served as well, that is eroding. And that is eroding because the consumers and the generations ahead see the current model is not sustainable. Mm. Uh, and, and depending on where you are sitting and what you are looking at, people will talk to you about the current model requires almost two to three planets equivalent of resources if we have to, and then we don't have, clearly we don't have that uh, luxury. Therefore, this model needs a change, and this model needs to look at uh, responsible growth almost as an integral uh, part. Now, I have spent most of my time in a business which, and I was fortunate enough to spend my time in a business which has seen this, maybe a little ahead of time, maybe a little uh, deeper than others, because in, in, in the coming years, in the coming years, it is uh, absolutely certain that uh, businesses which will survive, businesses which will grow, will uh, need to take this fourth dimension far more seriously uh, and make sure that it is integral to their business model and not another good thing to do. It's not CSR. It's not philanthropy. There is a very rich reason. There is a clear, sound business case for this. We may not see it today, but if you take a slightly longer and evolved view, we will find that the only way we will be able to grow when we take this element of responsibility in our uh, uh, in our uh, framework. Uh, and, and if truth be told, the governments get it, the global leaders get it. Uh, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on talking about how global leaders have tried to uh, talk about the 17 or the, 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 the SDGs. But if you see the, the basic thought behind the SDGs, thought, thought behind what we'll do with people, what we'll do with planet, and what we'll do with prosperity, because these are the three tenets on which the, it, 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 the base. Uh, they, they address all of these and they address it well. And why do I say our government gets it? If you just look back on some of the pronouncements which the government has made so far, uh, and the, it, things like Samagra Bharat, the inclusive and entrepreneurial India, things like uh, uh, Safal Bharat, things like uh, Sampurna Bharat, you know, these are all descriptions of uh, basically looking at inclusive growth, looking at a 360 degree model, looking at uh, prosperous and vibrant India and so on. And, and our Eastern Himalayan region is an integral part of this. And we have to make sure that it doesn't become uh, a kind of citadel in itself. It doesn't get siloed into something which is very Eastern Himalayas. Yeah, the solution for Eastern Himalayas is very unique to the region. Nice. But the, the platforms are global. The platforms are absolutely universal. Uh, so organizations get it. The fund managers today get it. The banking industries get it, but more importantly, the consumers get it. And that will be the strongest driver for, drive for change. When our younger generations and the consumer get it, the things begin to change very frequently. So I'll take a pause there and uh, reflect on uh, what I've said. And if something else comes to your mind, let me pick that up. Absolutely, sir. Um, we have one, uh, one more question related to uh, your esteemed organization. 
um, in terms of the ethos of sustainability, you've clearly mentioned so that it's very important that there has to be a paradigm shift in the fourth element of being responsible in terms of businesses, in how we engage with people, planet, and prosperity. So, sir, uh, Hindustan Unilever's ethos of sustainability ha is extremely robust, and uh, we would like to know uh, some of the learnings that uh, the company has uh, sort of imbibed and, uh, of course, imparted, uh, and and the workings of it, sir. Sure. No, that it's uh, uh, first of all, I just want to you know a simple health warning that uh, I used to work for Unilever, which is a fantastic company. I worked for a very long time with Unilever, and I have retired uh, about uh, about a year ago uh, after being on the board of uh, the Indian company for almost a decade. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I speak, I have learned in the school of Unilever, if there was one, and there is one. Uh, I have uh, learned there, but I speak as a speak as Pradeep Banerjee and not as a spokesman of uh, Unilever. Right. But I think uh, what I speak about is almost a universal truth. Uh, it is in the public domain, so there is no uh, no, nothing uh, confidential which I am uh, sharing. If, I, if you were to just step back, uh, what Unilever has done, I think, is a pretty uh, evolved model and they keep, became public with it in uh, early 2010 or in 2010 uh, uh, in the, when the decade started. And they made a very simple decision and, and which was based on their firm belief in the 4G model of growth, which I talked about, about getting responsibility integral to the business model and not as something additional things which have to be done. No, uh, it is central to the business model. And what it basically says is we will grow. We will, we have absolutely no uh, apology to make there because once we have a business only, then we can have impact. If we do not have a viable business, we will not have any impact. So we will grow. We will double our, let's say, whatever measure turnover, we double our size, double our impact. But we will do so in a manner which has got absolutely no impact on the planet. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, we will uh, make sure that uh, with the, the amount of uh, 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 energy we consume, the amount of resources we take, the amount of uh, 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 waste we leave behind, there would be having there will be no net addition to the, the environmental load of the planet because of what we do. Mm -hmm. So, decoupling the growth from the impact of the planet was a fundamental decision, and then it went a step ahead because it took a holistic view of. Uh, uh, the sustainability, and that is so so true when you look at the Eastern Himalayan region today, that we will not only do this, but we will also increase uh, our social impact. Right. So we will decouple our, the impact on the planet and create positive social impact. And it chose to do so uh, through creating sustainable growth through, through all the brands it has got. Uh, and every brand developed what it's called uh, a purpose. <laughs> and, it, uh, and another articulation of this Deep company belief is, belief is very simple, that brands with purpose grow, uh, people with purpose thrive at a personal level, it doesn't matter where you are, and organizations with purpose actually sustain over a longer period of time. So this is the fundamental thinking. So what it did actually uh, is quite interesting. It took three fundamental areas. Uh, the first area was uh, in the area of health and hygiene. Uh, in health and hygiene, they set themselves a big, uh, big goal. Uh, of uh, reaching so many people, improving nutrition and so on. And these are all metricized. And if you go to the website and they publish an annual report, you can uh, see the progress they have made. On some, they are ahead of the targets. On some, they are a little behind the targets. But they have uh, in transparency published that. The second big goal they took was, we will half the environmental footprint of what we have today. In other words, uh, when we double our environmental footprint will not grow with us. So all increase, so we will continue to reduce the impact we have on the planet. And all the growth will come out of virtually having no more impact. So things like greenhouse gases, things like the water which we consume, things like uh, waste and packaging, uh, the way we source our raw materials and packaging materials, including anything which is uh, agri-based, uh, we will uh, do. And the third was, we will do anything and everything which we can to improve the livelihoods of people uh, who work with us, their quality of life. One thing is to look at health and hygiene. The other one is to make sure that they're able to improve their livelihoods. So we'll look at both houses very clearly. So impact on people, impact on planet, 
uh, and impact on uh, you know health and health. these were the three goals. these were consistent with what the business of unilever is and there are you know sub goals behind each one each one of this uh, and it became very clear and let me take just pick one one example of this we source large amounts of material which is based on uh, agricultural produce we have paper and paper products we have got tea we have got cocoa we have got palm we have got uh, uh, so yeah, in all sorts of, uh, and we said, uh, we will have a code, we will have a code of uh, uh, practices and we'll go to those vendors and those plantations and those areas and those factories which follow that code. Because uh, we are large, but we are also humble enough to know that we alone cannot do everything. We need to do it with our partners like uh, in the civil society, with NGOs, with like-minded people. Uh, and we say, even with our competition, we are more than happy to work. Because as long as it is going to impact the ecosystem where we work, and each one of us has to mind the ecosystem which we impact. And if, if all of us begin to take uh, this uh, enlightened point of view, the world will be a much better place. You know, that was the kind of uh, leadership which uh, went behind this. So you'd be su surprised to know, uh, for example, now we've got a code for where we will buy tea from. We've got a code from where we will buy palm from. In fact, we were at the forefront of giving birth to uh, uh, the round table for sustainable palm, uh, and, which is uh, RSPO. Uh, and we are active kind of uh, participants in that. So industry standards on what sustainability should mean. Uh, what does it mean for the small holder farmers there? Uh, and using all sorts of technology to make sure that the benefit reach those people of companies like Unilever buying palm and palm derivatives. You know, those kind of infrastructure was, uh, uh, put in place. And, and we have been steadily uh, increasing the share of our total procurement uh, from where we were 10 years ago to now, uh, increasingly from almost 100% uh, sustainable sources. Mm -hmm. Now, in some areas, we have been able to exceed, and some areas we have not been able to exceed, and we will therefore continue to work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter whether we reach 90% or 100% or 95%. What matters is, have you made a difference have you got the industry standards? Have large number of people got impacted? And the fact is, they have got impacted. And, and this is a never-ending journey. It will continue. And I'm absolutely convinced in years to come, this thinking would be with, not with Unilever, but with, the, with, with a lot, large number of people. Because uh, if you see the way uh, the large businesses are growing now, uh, when I look at large transnational corporations, large multinational, large governments, uh, uh, they're talking the same language. When I see the way the Paris Accord, with all its trials and tribulations, the way it is moving, uh, that we will not let 1.5 degrees come in uh, mm -hmm. and we'll do it ahead of time. It all comes from a very simple enlightened self-interest that, look, we can do, keep on doing what we are doing, but if we go beyond a certain warming level, let's say, beyond mm -hmm. the two degrees, life would be very different for us, certainly, mm -hmm. but more importantly for our children and grandchildren. So, you know, this thing is really gaining momentum. If you see the neutral, uh, the net, the zero neutrality principles, which is coming into Europe now, uh, it will lead to far, far reaching changes. If you see the way energy transition is beginning to happen, people are reshaping their business model dramatically and large companies, not small companies. Uh, and I believe they are all the, all these changes are for good. For example, uh, the look for renewable changes, the, look for uh, naturally uh, natural gas as fuel versus some of the fossil fuel, uh, other uh, fuels which we have. Looking at large areas of energy storage, looking at large areas of carbon sequestering, mm -hmm. where uh, uh, Eastern Himalaya has got a huge role to play. So all these are becoming currency of uh, today. Uh, and uh, clearly the three tenets of uh, uh, economic principles which we have gone by, it is we are way beyond that. And people are beginning to take a full 360-degree uh, look, the circularity principles are now getting into our language. Uh, and uh, I do believe we will leave this place a better place than what we inherited. That's the belief. Now let's go and make it happen. Absolutely, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think you've summed up everything really well in terms of business frameworks, conservation, and uh, your own perspectives for that matter, sir. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. A very warm welcome to you, Vivek Ji, Saxena, Vivek Saxena Ji, the country head of, of the, the glorious IUCN, who have been in the business of actually environmental protection and conservation for close to a century. 
across more than 160 countries in partnership with over 400 members and having a base of 1,700 plus experts. Just to quote from your vision of IUCN, sir, the vision is to create a just world that values and conserves nature. And taking it further to your mission statement, it is all about equitable asset sharing while being ecologically sustainable and integrating people, ecology, and economy. So having set the context with your vision and mission and the kind of work that Sukhian has been doing, I've got primarily three asks from you. One is how and why should ecology now become the center stage of ecology, of ecolo uh, of ecology and economy? And the, how can we lay the foundation for future economic development with ecology being part of the center stage? Two is to do this, what are the frameworks required for new development policies? And what are the actions therefore? And how can we take our learnings from the past follies, if I may say so? And three, the most important one because of your spread, geographical spread and spread in the mind space of experts. What is IUCN's plans for global wilding and creating an economic model through natural assets, and again, to repeat, integrating people, ecology, and economy. Over to you, Saxena Saab, and thank you so much for your time. Good morning, uh, Mr. Praveer and everyone. First of all, let me uh, congratulate you for organizing the 8th Eastern Himalayan Nature Economics Forum during the most challenging times of COVID and the thematic area which is very, very relevant, that ecology is economy. As you rightly pointed out, that the, today, during the COVID crisis, and when we are looking towards at the same time, the entire economic activities, they have come under threat, and the entire world is at crossroads, and uh, our all further future development pathways also need to be redefine in a manner so that we have to take care of the ecology or nature also. So the question is that why and how ecology should be at the center stage and is at the foundation of economic development. If we see that the very basis of the foundation of the economic development and what we describe today our growth is in terms of how our entire economic development process is related to the use of the natural resources. And resources are not infinite, and resources have to be used in such a manner we do degrade the nature, and these resources are available for each and every generation. And that is what, when we you describe the sustainable development or sustainable development goals. And in the process of the economic development, somehow we have given the ecological aspect or the nature conservation aspect back a stage somewhere. And we thought that, that only pursuit is in terms of the economic growth is that the more and more we develop more consumer items, the more vehicles without caring that the type of emission, the type of pollution the we generate with, through which we see the today's problems of the air pollution or uh, you can say that degradation of our land resources, the soil health, the cleaner sources of the waters, the uh, pollution in the rivers, plastic pollution, marine life threat, and all these things somehow because of this, it has caused very much threat to the very process of the concept of the economic development because presently we conceive that we as a human beings or homo sapiens are the most superior species and we have all the right to use any species or their habitat to degrade their habitats and disturbing their this equilibrium which nature has provided in the pursuit of the economic development. But if you see that on planet Earth, planet Mother Earth, there are 
millions and millions of species and every species has a unique role in the ecosystem and that needs to be recognized we may be aware of their importance or value or, or we may not be aware because our knowledge is also limited but at the same time we should have a knowledge that we have to take care of the nature and we have to take care of the various species their habitats and our development should be in the process so that we don't degrade or disturb their habitats which leads to the extinction of the species so that's why wonderful sir I could, just, I could just interrupt you here i mean the very fact that over 60% of our country's gdp and over 50% of the global gdp is dependent on nature and natural resources is something which is not not really being announced or it is something which is being downgraded because of the current economic and consumerism model that we have so you know iucn's role which you have been doing so sterlingly over the last 70 years or more will have to become that much more proactive going forward now yeah certainly as you rightly pointed out with in terms of the statistics but the statistics which you just mentioned in terms of the contribution of the natural resources in the economic development process but the in in the pathway of economic development like that these statistics in which the role or importance of the resources which are at use that is not given that importance or you can say that publicity to recognize their importance that's why now in the present covid crisis when we see that even a one small tiny virus can bring everything to a halt and this present crisis is also somewhere rooted to the disruption of the ecosystems disruption in the ecology so that's why again we have to relook that ecology should be at the center stage and it should be at the foundation of the economic development so that ecology is economy is a very very relevant thematic area which you are trying to bring it to the focus through your very important uh, uh, this summit in which i think certainly the message which will be taken up through this summit and it will be a, also an eye opener or learning to all the planners all the relevant stakeholders to integrate ecology at the center stage in all the planning process now coming back to your uh, second uh, question that how can we break from the traditional industrialization and forge a new path for forward looking environment policy in action the learns when we say that the ecology should be at the center stage somehow this should also be reflected into the future pathways related to the environmental policies and action so that traditional industrialization where we hardly care of about the end use of a product or when we talk about the circular economy so whatever we resource you use for a particular consumer item or for a particular industrial product in the end use we hardly bother that whether after its use how much it or even during its use how much is is causing a pollution in terms of the air pollution water pollution and other types of pollution and at end use if it is degrading further without taking care of its degradable component that uh, whether after it is biodegradable or not or if so in end use how we are going it to we are going to dispose it of so that it is not causing further harm so these all aspects related to the uh, components of the circular economy the end use the sustainable consumption and uh, all these issues that need to be at the center stage in the forward looking environmental policies and consequent actions relatively one of the key lessons which though we are talking today at the issues pertaining to the you can say himalayan states but the role which himalayan states play is very very important for the people downhill and because maybe the our water resources the sustainability of our waters the availability of the drinking water the management of the himalayan watersheds that also has to be integrated into this our future environmental policies and action and you see that in delhi and ncr region that air pollution has become such a challenging issue that for those 2 3 4 months just at the onset of the winter 
and for three months the life becomes so you can say miserable that outside when you see that lot of pollution and this causes lot of different type of diseases and at the same time it also impacts uh, the economic activities because of the various regulations if the pollution level goes high then we have to give regulation in terms of uh, stopping of certain activities construction activities so in totality we have to uh, look towards the industrialization process a paradigm shift from the traditional pathways which presently we are following and integrating the resource conservation aspect in all the industrialization process and these are the key lessons which we need to learn from the past downturn now your another uh, query was that the iucn international union for conservation of nature what are iucn plans for global rebuilding and land restoration efforts and how can this be used as a catalyst for a revolution of a new growth which integrates people ecology and economy it's a very very relevant and you see that iucn international union for conservation of nature the largest global conservation network having more than 1300 institutional members that includes the governments as a state members civil society organization specialized institutions and also more than 15000 iucn commission members across six iucn commissions they play a very important role since the setting up of the iucn which came into uh, being uh, just after the world war in 1948 and in its journey of more than 70 years it has played a very pivotal role in shaping the global conservation agenda based on the needs from decade to decade maybe setting up of the global conservation agenda the coming up of the three rio conventions related to the climate change biodiversity and desertification and the biodiversity conservation then uh, ig biodiversity targets now post 2020 biodiversity framework the sustainable development goals and respective targets now again when we talk of that integration of the ecology or ecology to be brought at the central stage to so iucn has again emphasized during the launch of the global standard for the nature based solutions which have been launched in 2020 only in july this year that we have to integrate nature based solution standards in all our programs and policies so that take care of the nature so this is one of the key message which iucn has a plan uh, <coughs> especially these standards were to be initially launched during the world conservation congress but <coughs> sorry but now uh, with the process of uh, uh, this world conservation congress because could not happen which was scheduled in france marcel uh, in june then it was rescheduled in january 2021 but because of the covid it has been <coughs> postponed again so that is the central stage where iucn would like to bring all the conservation partners including our, through the, our iucn business and biodiversity program through which we sensitize various corporates and business houses to integrate sustainability concerns and biodiversity conservation aspects into their business practices so these are the iucn plans in future also through sensitization capacity building uh, advocacy and building up of the programs to impress upon so that the iucn global standards along with other iucn conservation tools may be the red listing of the species which based on the categorization of a particular species into particular threat category it triggers the conservation action for conservation of the species and also the iucn other conservation tools the green listing of protected area they are the important iucn plans in future uh, which will be taken up during the conservation congress if it is not happening physically but through the various virtual forums Uh, so that uh, through the iucn policies programs vision and mission we are able to integrate all these aspects to integrate the people ecology and economy and emphasizing that ecology should be at the center stage of the economy and ecology is economy the very relevant theme of this summit will certainly be a very great 
catalyst for all the participants and the messages learned during the summit will be taken further into for integration into the future policies policies development and further action thank you very much thank you thank you so much uh, saksena sahab and i am so happy to note that you brought up that the whole role of corporates and business houses apart from government will be an integral part of your advocacy and awareness building campaign because at the end of the day they are driving our economy in whichever form today and we at balipara foundation look forward to our continued partnership with iucn and we continue to seek your advice guidance and wisdom to try and solve this current issue through bringing an ecology into the center stage of economy thank you so much saksena sahab thank you for your time uh, thank you so much and uh, thank you for inviting me and also for organizing this summit on a very very important team and i wish all the best we are grateful we are grateful for your support thank you thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts on the subject of ecology is economy without going into the damning statistics which raise fundamental questions about the environmental impact of human lifestyles or the potential economic benefits of looking after nature assets i would like to jump straight into the key levers which in my opinion drive changes in mindsets around nature assets firstly environmental and ecological warning signs secondly government regulation and then corporate stewardship of course supported by innovation and technology and finally shift in customer behavior i believe that the largest impact would be from a shift in customers choosing businesses or brands that have environmentally sustainable practices the two biggest barriers to this are consumer apathy and affordability we as businesses must find a way to address the challenge of perceived affordability of nature friendly products by finding ways to value long term ecological impact to offset short term economic costs passing the benefits directly to the consumer once this is addressed i do believe that there would be enough societal traction which would alter the entire value creation and recognition process for businesses and bring the focus back on nature capital thank you thank you for the wonderful session and i'm glad to have um, pradeep panuji with us from uh, to answer questions he was part of this panel today and he spoke with us about um, how businesses need to be more conscious and uh, mainstreaming that across the business value chain uh, good afternoon mr banerji great to have you with us we have quite a few questions but in the interest of time we're running a bit short so i will put one question to you that has come from our audience which is um you talked a lot about consciousness and businesses so how do we incentivize this what are the structures we need to put in place uh what are the incentives we need to put in place to drive this so that um there's actual a uh, change in businesses and business move towards greater consciousness and are nudged to actually incorporating this in a meaningful way would love to hear your thoughts on this yeah thank you joanna for uh, inviting me and uh, again at the onset uh, uh congratulations to you for uh, bringing together this forum it's a, it's a great subject and some of us uh, who have the, the passion for uh, the new model i think we should not miss out any opportunity to make sure that we drive some consistent messaging and i was uh, fortunate enough to listen to what was said in the session which was going on just now uh, all right points and if i were to pick up one uh, uh, issue when i when uh, i had talked to you last time i had talked about a framework uh, which is in my mind which will make this transition uh, possible fundamental to that is 
seeing our economic model today, which is essentially based around uh, what I keep on talking about, the 3G model of growth, which is based around growth that is continuous, growth that is competitive, growth that is profitable. That has served its purpose. That has served its purpose well. And I see uh, today we are at a juncture because it's been enormously successful. But as we go ahead, very clearly our consumption pattern is becoming such that we just do not have the luxury of having a resource base which can support this. So it is fundamentally unsustainable. So therefore, the fourth dimension of growth, which is the responsible growth, gets added on. And to me, uh, this is a fundamental shift which will, which is beginning to happen. I can see it in many of the organizations uh, already. And these are the organizations which have smelled the coffee and, and have almost taken a uh, leadership uh, role in making sure the entire economy, the entire uh, industry, the entire categories make this shift. Uh, we have to work with governments, we have to work with NGOs, we have to work with uh, uh, the civil society in general to make sure that becomes the heart of all economic model which we have uh, in coming years. And this would essentially be around making sure that we do not increase the burden on the planet and create a positive social impact as we grow our businesses, because the businesses uh, ought to grow. That is the only way to create the economic kind of energy, which, which improves the quality of life. And we have seen it from uh, almost the days of industrial revolution when uh, and, and our each generation successively has uh, enjoyed benefits of medicine, enjoyed benefits of technology and so on. And by no means my uh, thinking is around turning the clock back. It is about doing all of that, but doing it in a manner which decouples the impact of growth from the impact we have on the planet. And now there are many ways of doing it. But increasingly, there is evidence that certainly people get it. Uh, the governments get it. Globally, the set of leaders get it. I think the, uh, the SDGs are a great examples. What the Indian government has done is a great example. Uh, organizations, some of the organizations uh, uh, are beginning to change their business model to include this and bring it center, uh, center stage and not you know, hide behind CSR kind of uh, activities. So these economic evolving, the, this uh, evolving economic models in my view uh, would be different for each category, would be different for each geography. And my earnest desire would be that as we uh, do this wonderful work in the Eastern Himalayan region, uh, we make sure that we integrate that rather than uh, with the with the larger economic uh, environment of the country uh, and and if i say beyond the country rather than trying to straight jacket it or silo it uh, and and protect it in, in in some manner because we need to have evolved thinking which will uh, decouple uh, the grow the the, the 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 growth from uh, the impact we have but yet let each and every person uh, in, on the planet enjoy the fruits of that economic growth so it's a new economic model which we need to be talking about at every opportunity we get thank you thank you and i think just to tie into that uh, if you can make three recommendations on the key incentives we need to build to push this kind of thinking uh, what would they be i think somebody said that very clearly uh, we need to be, uh, the, the, the fundamentally this change will be driven by the society or the consumers because that's where, uh, and therefore uh, any, any uh, framework which uh, brings forth the benefits of doing the business in the new model uh, and, and talks about it, socializes it, popularizes it, that would be a great step forward. And we need to be encouraging this uh, to a large extent through uh, call it uh, economic incentives, call it uh, social incentives, call it some of the regulatory incentives which we can give. That's number one for me. Uh, second for me is product innovation. Product innovation which fundamentally consumes uh, lesser resources would be the way to go forward. Uh, and to me, uh, this is a very important aspect of uh, the economic cycle for a simple reason that uh, sustainability for the sake of sustainability would be a would be a difficult task if as business leaders as uh, political leaders we are able to establish a framework where there is a strong case for sustainability in business strong business case for uh, doing the right thing then the acceleration would be huge 
and this would come in the shape of let us say take energy the shape of uh, figure that if you use if you reliance on um, greener energy or uh, recycle or uh, energy is uh, more then you ought to be benefiting from people who are using the old model of fossil fuels for example so there would be a uh, uh, every step taken which will regulatory political um, many other frameworks which essentially convert uh, a sustainable way of doing business the responsible way of doing business give it some economic sustenance if you need to do it for few years perhaps in some areas maybe longer in some areas but eventually we must have the road map in which uh, having a economic model which is having no impact on planet becomes self sustaining and economically viable to me that's the second part and the last would be governments can play a big role uh, and here many of the organizations need to get in uh, along with the governments to get a regulatory framework which promotes uh, activities uh, for example uh, if there was a marketplace for because what we describe as waste today is actually not waste it is just resources for which we have no use for today so if we have pure visibility of that at a very simple stage if we have a marketplace for uh, that at at some stage that will bring the buyers and sellers together because uh, there is no no uh, universal definition of waste somebody's waste is somebody's raw material and we have seen it from time and time again you can't create or destroy that and 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 therefore many any economic any regulatory uh, measure which promotes that would be a big big incentive for this uh, transition and i believe many of the governments and many of the coalition of governments are beginning to do it and if you see the european model which is really talking about essentially neutral neutrality at a big scale or from there the energy transition uh, kind of uh, efforts which will emanate would fundamentally alter the way we do business today and i think those those are exactly the right things to do thank you so much mr banerjee for taking the time to join us and sharing your insights i think these are some great action points that we can take forward for the future um i now think it's time for us to move to the next session and i call on ipshita to take this forward wish you all the very best thank you i'll convey that thanks joanna i would also like to thank all our respected panelists for their keen insights now we present to you a discussion focused on mushrooms and livelihoods in conversation with Catherine Marshania renowned videographer from Australia Stephen Axford well known fungi photographer also from Australia Hi Catherine and Steve today Hi Hi so today I take this honor to welcome you both to the 8th Eastern Milan National Forum 2020 and uh, its first partial edition to address a short talk on rewilding the economy through ecology uh, in palipara foundation uh, 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 we seek to tackle the problem of ecological conservation and human development uh, through its principal nestromics to redrawing the ancient ecology is uh, economy paradigm for resilient and sustainable relationship between people and nature uh, for our future uh, moving straight to the interaction as uh, you Catherine and Steve are being involved with the foundation for the real fishes livelihood uh, initiative and fungal assessment uh, study across northeast india uh, if you can share your experience on the uniqueness in the biodiversity of northeast india i mean you guys have traveled the forest across the world Uh, uh what is your views on the north is uh, indian forest and its biodiversity yeah. <laughs> um so northeast india it's uh it, it the biodiversity is is changes from altitude you know so there's very different forests depending on where we are there so there's the tropical and subtropical forests that we see on the plains and there's some beautifully um preserved forests in the national parks in assam like halongpa and like uh kazarunga kazarunga um where we see a lot of biodiversity of trees and because we see biodiversity of trees 
we see biodiversity of fungi, yeah? The fungi, mushrooms anyway, usually are the forest. You have a lot more biodiversity of trees and of fungi. So in the old growth forests like Kalongapa, you get a lot of variety of fungus there. Mm. And, and similarly, as we go up in altitude, the forests of Megalia were incredibly biodiverse. The ones that had been uh, preserved as sacred groves were incredibly biodiverse, as they are in the fauna and also the flora. Um, so that was, for us, that was a real buzz, seeing uh, forests that were in such pristine condition and, and you know, all credit to the people of Megalia for preserving those forests as sacred groves. And then we did actually go to Sikkim as well, to some of the high altitude forests. And the, and again, the very preserved forests at high altitude, the, the biodiversity of plants and fungi were quite extreme, you know, like a carpet of fungus in those forests up there. Um, the thing that we did find and we we continue to find and it's interesting we observed it in northeast india where we came up upon compromised forests forests that had been not managed as well as they could be the fungal biodiversity is also very poor so you get both the plant biodiversity and the fungal biodiversity as being very poor and and also we did go to um a regenerating forest on Majuli. Do you want to talk about yeah. that forest? But, uh, there was fungi there, but there's not a huge diversity of fungus on Majuli, on the, the forests that are being regrown there. That will probably change in the ensuing years. As the trees mature, then the fungus will mature with them and the biodiversity will increase as it is with the animals at the moment, that as you plant the trees, then you get all of these animals in. Tigers, I think, are in there. And you know, rare oh, species of vultures and things like this. And as, uh, as time goes by, then you get more different varieties of fungus turning up there as well. But for the moment, it's just a few species. So, so I guess where the forests have been preserved and conserved, it's very exciting, you know, that there's lots of diversity of plant, animal and fungus, which is you know, useful on two levels. It's useful to the people who live on the forest fringe and it's useful to the forest because, you know, the more we study the biodiversity of forests, the more we realise that everything is connected. So when you walk into a forest, the inclination is to see the trees but, and, the, and the plants. But in fact, you know, it's as important to think about what's below the ground, connecting it all, and, and that we only see, you know, mushrooms when they fruit. So, but, you know, in that ecosystem, everything is connected. And so if you're not managing the whole ecosystem, then you're compromising it not only for the forest itself, but then I suppose the progression of that is if people are living from the forest, then you're compromising it for that as well. But certainly in terms of biodiversity of fungi, in those forests that are well managed, um, like the sacred groves and like the high altitude forests that have been protected, there's been, we saw lots of fungi that potentially is of use to human being and yeah so so that biodiversity is very important into the future uh thank you i mean uh, i think it was very insightful and i hope our viewers viewers today would get uh, an insight of the biodiversity of this, of this region uh who hasn't uh, experienced it yet uh moving forward to further have some insight to the uh, Northeast India landscape and uh, its social aspect for our audience. Uh, Steve, if you can uh, share your perspective on the great uh, diversity of uh, indigenous communities in Northeastern India and how they live, breed and uh, celebrate nature. Well, we, 
We've been in northeast India, I think, three or four times now. Four times. Four times and travelled through Nagaland, Arunachal, Assam, Meghalaya, I think that, and Sikkim. So travelled quite extensively. And in the tribal areas where the people have been living there, for hundreds, maybe thousands of years in some cases, they're very much more connected to the land and they tend to know the fungus that grows. So they, they know which ones are edible and which ones aren't. So they make use of fungus, whereas people who have just recently come in there or are city people don't know as much about this as uh, as the tribal people or the local people that live there. So they're very much more in touch with nature. So they just have an intrinsic understanding that the forest is important, that you can't just destroy the forest and plant crops. It doesn't really work very well when you do that. Whereas if you keep parts of the forest and parts of the you know, national parks, keep the animals, then everything fits together and works well. And you don't get the famines and the, the wild fluctuations that you might get otherwise. Yeah, the door, all the, the local customs, that nature was very important, that they, or they, they might worship the sun or the moon, but this was all to do with seasons. So it's all to do with the land and with growing things and with their, the way they fit into it. Whereas we tend to look at it now, the city people, you, you think of the, a forest as being a collection of trees and not a forest as a, a whole unit. And I think the, the tribal people more think of nature in terms of the whole nature rather than just individual components. And I think the sacred groves were an example of where they regard, people regarded themselves as custodians of the, the land and the forest rather than it being just something to be used. Yeah, you look at your, yourself as a part of nature rather than nature just being a bunch of trees that you can cut down and get wood from or a crop that you can make some food from. The, we, you know, in the city, we tend to think that this is, you know, a crop is, you don't need to do anything apart from some dirt and some wheat seeds and you get wheat, some rice seeds and you get rice. Well, you need a lot more than that, of course. And I think right. uh, the native people understand that. Right. Uh, yes, I mean, it's, it's very interesting and very uh, encouraging, Steve, to uh, hear your perspective on this. Uh, and we have been doing this uh, fungi assessment across Northeast India since 2018 uh, with you guys. And uh, we are looking forward to doing more to get near to a conclusion uh, to finding and domesticating econ economically valuable fungi species. Uh, fungi could be uh, actually one of, one of, one of the potential non-timber forest produce, which can be a source of livelihood along with its all other health and ecological benefits. Uh, Catherine, if you can share your perspective on uh, on the scopes of Northeast fungi for livelihood, its perspective on richer's uh, uh, cultivation and uh, harvesting of the wild fungi for livelihood. So again, um, going back, it's it's kind of linked to the biodiversity of forests. So um, and the amount of edibles that are in a forest. So down on the plains in Assam. There were a few edibles in the forests down there, but not a lot. You know, they're like our tropical forests, um, there doesn't tend to be as many what we call ectomycorrhizal fungi, the fungi that is connected to the roots of trees, as there are in the higher altitude forests. So therefore, the prospect of cultivating changes. So on the plains, we saw some beautiful examples of villages being able to grow an oyster-style mushroom 
in um, a very small building on their properties and being able to earn quite a lot of money from that. And that's something that's being adopted a lot over Asia, we see. And so the, the potential for that as a money earner for people being able to grow the mushrooms that grow on wood on a very small plot of land and actually create a very marketable um, product um, from subsistence farming. It's, it's fantastic, actually. And then the more that we test um, the scientists come in and DNA test the forest fungi that we're finding in those tropical forests, the more fungi we'll find that's edible that can be growing in that way, you know, done in a little shack. It just needs um, spore being uh, spawn being able to be produced in a sterile environment. Um, but it's very low tech, which is fantastic for villages. But then as you get into those forests that we do in Megalia and in Kim, where there's quite a lot of edible ectomycorrhizal fungi, now those fungi are attached to the roots of the trees. So you can't grow them in a little shed on your property. They only grow in the forest because they and the trees are as one. <laughs> so, so then what we see in, uh, we saw in Megalia a little bit was people collecting the, that fungi for food on a, in a very village basis. Occasionally we saw people who were collecting it and drying it which is value adding to it and then earning quite a lot of money for it at the marketplace. And then overseas, we've in other parts of Asia, we've seen that being done on a village basis where if you took a small village like, um, you know, the wonderful woman that we met, Kong, who was very knowledgeable about the forest fungi in her forest in Megalia, if, you know, someone like her became a central point for people to bring their mushrooms to where there was a drying kiln, you know, again, very low tech, then, you know, that whole village could earn money from collecting wild mushrooms, value adding to it by drying it, which means that it's, it, it prolongs the season, and then taking that to a market. And we know that in other parts of Asia, you know, then it is also traded overseas in places that where some of the fungi that we saw in Galia and Sikkim actually reaches a very high price, like chanterelles in France or matsutake in Japan. You know, they they do actually collect a huge price for local villages. So it, it can be a very sustainable industry. There is a little bit of research happening on how many of those mushrooms you can take from the forest and how many you need to leave to keep that fruiting of the mushrooms happening so that it isn't over um, over harvested. Um, but, you know, certainly the, the examples that we've seen um, on a small scale in northeast India and on a larger scale elsewhere in Asia, um, it's certainly something that could be very beneficial to the local people. But, and again, you know, that's where the science of doing surveys is so important because then you find out, well, what is edible in those forests? And, and we certainly found species that weren't necessarily regarded as edible or medicinal in northeast India, but we suspected were elsewhere. That could be uh, another development on top of the known, the already the knowledge that people have. So very viable, you know, mushrooms, you know, I think globally it's very uh, zeitgeist at the moment. People are really starting to understand how, one, important mushrooms are to the ecosystem, but two, how beneficial they can be to human beings and, and how the knowledge about that is very patchy across the world. But we have these little pockets where people do are experts and Northeast India is one of those where you've got Ultrad people who definitely know quite a bit about fungi. I hope with our vision uh, on the project, uh, on this uh, fungi project, we would do our best to incorporate our views and uh, should be able to incorporate a successful model on fungi cultivation as a livelihood opportunity for the rural community. Uh, that's how we uh, relate, uh, we bring back uh, ecology into the economy. It's been a lot of learning always to interact with you guys. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for this session and uh, really appreciate uh, your time 
uh, for this. Looking forward to seeing you guys very, very soon. Well, thank you. It's It's been a great learning for us too, working with the inspiring scientists from Balapara Foundation, but also the village people who became our experts on fungi, who knew far more about the local fungi than any of us. So um, it's been a great privilege to work with Balapara. Thank you for inviting us to do that and for also inviting us to participate in this session. Yeah, it's always it's been a pleasure to come out. It's always a pleasure to come out to India. We enjoy it very much. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you, Stephen and Catherine, for your insightful talk on documentation and exploring mushrooms as livelihood opportunities for the rural. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a special message from someone who is the first Indian to ski to the North Pole and South Pole and summit Mount Everest within the span of a year. Please welcome Padma Shri Ajit Bajaj, Managing Director of Snow Leopard Adventures. Let's hear. Namaskar. I'm glad to be associated with the Eastern Himalayan Naturenomics Forum organized by the Balipara Foundation. Your vision highlighting the interdependence between economy and ecology is vital and the need of the hour. There is a Native American, a Cree Indian saying, when the last tree is cut, the last fish eaten and the last stream poisoned, you will realize that you cannot eat money. Sustainable development is vital for this blue marble, our planet. And as far as we know, the only place on this universe which sustains life. Well, having skied to the North Pole, the very top of our planet, the South Pole, and having climbed Mount Everest with my daughter Dia from the north, from, from Tibet, I think Mother Nature is supreme. Um, when we were at the base camp, we realized how small and insignificant we were compared to this beautiful mountain. The Tibetans call Mount Everest Komalangma mountain goddess or mother goddess of the universe. We human beings are so small, so insignificant compared to nature that we have to always approach nature with humility and respect. We human beings can never ever conquer nature. Humanity and nature have to be seen as one to really fix the climate crisis. Uh, the climate crisis is a reality today and uh, the only way forward is for us to, to live our lives in a sustainable manner. Any sort of development has to have sustainability as a major, major part of it. And well, nature definitely has enough for our needs for 7.8 billion people that inhabit our planet, but not enough for our greed. My message from the top of Mount Everest to my fellow citizens, again, has to be about respecting nature. We Indians, we, we have to be proud of our ancient civilization and we have always lived in perfect harmony with Mother Nature. That has to be the message about respecting Mother Nature. And when we Indians put our mind to something, there is no challenge too big for us. We have to lead the way and get this message 
of sustainable development and living life in perfect harmony with mother nature to the world thank you thank you mr bajaj for your strong and enlightening message on the eastern himalayas we now take the honor to introduce and launch the co creation model rural futures and impulse ngo network partnership let us hear from karma baljor reputed tv journalist and news anchor and the editor in chief of east mojo news hasina karbi founder and chairperson of impulse ngo network saurav malhotra design, designer of rural futures at balipara foundation india Welcome to the 8th edition of the Eastern Himalayan Nature Economics Forum. This year the theme is ecology is economy. And I have two interesting people who are working on an initiative that brings together environment and how restoring it will reduce unsafe migration. So today I have Hasina Karbi who is the founder of Impulse NGO Network. and impulse social enterprises they have about 20 years behind this organization and it's an award winning impulse model lab and sorov malotra co founder and designer of a rural futures framework at balipara foundation envision creating this interdependence between ecology in economy thanks karma thanks thanks for having us i think what i'd like to talk about is that this interdependence has really always been there we've just sort of forgotten that this link exists and therefore are facing the current climate crisis so if you look at how agriculture began so about 7000 years ago uh humans were actually uh foraging from forests and humans were developing forests for agricultural purposes and for food the amazon rainforest is a great example of how humans have actually helped curate a forest for agricultural purposes what has happened between then and now is that about half of our population in the world lives in rural areas but it's the entire world's population that is dependent on natural resources be it forest resources be it water or even the air that you breathe it all comes from forest and natural based resources all the wealth of the world on the other hand is accumulating in urban hotspots right so 97% of the wealth of the world is residing in urban hotspots whereas half of the world's people are living in rural areas so there has been an over exploitation there's been over over consumption and i think because of these two reasons we are currently facing the climate crisis global warming all the floods that we see the connection there is also that environmental degradation that has led to climate crisis actually leads to many challenges within indigenous communities so many many of our communities in the eastern himalayan region live on the front lines of climate challenges for example communities the mission community in the kaziranga national park area live on the front lines of flood based challenges yeah. but there is deforestation happening across the zones in the northeast we have lost about 100000 hectares of forest in the last year this results in water shortages lack of groundwater table resurgence uh reduction in soil fertility and therefore reduction in agricultural output and about 70% of india's population is dependent on agriculture and maybe even about 85% of the northeast population is dependent on agriculture so by destroying the environment we're actually reducing people's access to livelihoods and by doing this people do not have access to livelihoods anymore agricultural yields have gone down therefore the amount of revenue that you earn every year has also gone down which is what is driving people to say move from kaziranga to delhi kaziranga to bombay kaziranga to bangalore for jobs these jobs are not always nice jobs right i mean you spend 70% of what you earn on a house yeah. and you send some money money back home and you have nothing really left so it is environmental degradation that drives the lack of social assets people don't have access to education healthcare energy water which drives people to move through the rural futures framework through ecology is economy this year what what we are trying to say is that environment is the economy so the global of the global economy comes from the environment directly 
So what is the whole debate about and the, and the fact that for this post-COVID plan, the whole world is creating a post-COVID plan, we need to keep the environment at the center stage. We need to figure how we can create green jobs for all the people who've migrated back to where they belong, how these green jobs can be linked to the growth of the environment and not the degradation. So this is what we want to talk about. And, and, and I think that we will arrive at a policy blueprint at the end of it as a recommendation, not only for the northeastern states of India, but for the eastern Himalayan countries as well. Right. And someone who's, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, seeing this change on the ground. Hasina was traveling uh, through COVID and floods also to understand how it's really impacting the people. Hasina, do you think, uh, you know, since you've worked so much, uh, 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 to uh, help people as far as uh, migration, unsafe migration is concerned, works now, this, this model? If you're looking at the unsafe migration aspect, I think um, the lockdown and COVID has made it more um, visible to the entire world that people are returning back and livelihood will be completely a challenge. And we who have been working with Livelihood Initiative over the last 13 years through Impulse Social Enterprises have seen that women have had the power of economics, the power of market and resilience, and that has helped them to make decision not to migrate unsafely. Now, they're coming back, uh, just weaving and textile will not be enough uh, to create jobs at a, at a local level. So looking at it from the context that they're living in an environment which has richness, and that environment can actually become um, a revenue, an ecosystem that can come together. So the co-creation is completely a valuable aspect of how communities, indigenous population, communities who are migrating back home, uh, can actually create jobs which is more local based. Right. And so you told me that, uh, you know, about um, 100,000 acres of forests, Hectare, have, yeah. hectares of forests have been lost here in, in, in the Northeast. So in a way, if more people are coming back, hence their dependence, uh, you know, on the forests will even be more. So do you see more degradation? Uh, is there, uh, you know, bigger challenges ahead for you? Yeah, I think, I think it is both a challenge and an opportunity depending on how we really play the next few months. I think the next few months are absolutely critical. So what we have seen through a lot of our work on the ground is that many people who, who say have been away from home for the last four or five years are now coming back to the areas where we have been implementing the Rural Futures model of the Balipara Foundation. And people now see prospect and aspirations in the villages. Many of the youth that chose to not migrate al along with their peers now have jobs together with our projects, not jobs per se, but entrepreneurial sort of ventures through nature, right? So the way that we've been creating jobs is by growing forests, growing nurseries, growing agroforests. So your livelihood then is linked positively to the planting of trees, to the growth of forests and to the growth of your farms, to the enhancement of biodiversity on your farms by converting them to agroforestry based initiatives. So it is a very fine line between overpopulation being a heightened pressure on the forest and therefore deforestation, it could very easily go that way. But what we have to collectively push now through a national mandate, through a regional mandate for the Eastern Himalayas, is to create green jobs at this point in time, is to show people that there is a path, which is not the path of environmental degradation, but is a path of conservation. And in fact, in the long term, many of our data, many of the modeling that we've done actually proves that the amount of revenue that you will be earning through these nature pro jobs is actually much more. Is actually much more than what you would be earning by chopping a forest. Mm -hmm. so, so the economics speak for themselves, but we need to have a solid collective push now to make sure that we can implement the model and then after a year, the economics will, will actually talk for itself. But sort of, it's also about greed, isn't it? You know, you say that such uh, uh, projects are sustainable yeah. and there is a way for people to make money. Yeah. But again, the question comes back, yeah. how much is enough? Yeah. You know, people can get greedy. So yeah. if they see a source yeah. of livelihood coming in from the forest, yeah. what stops them from over-exploiting yeah. the natural resources? Yeah. I think, I think our communities in the Eastern Himalayan zone, and I can especially talk about our experiences with the Boro community through our projects in the Udalguri and the Sonitpur districts, is that people have already suffered the causes of over-exploitation in the early 90s, in the early 2000s. A lot of the forests of Assam were lost 
back in those days for reasons that we're all aware of. And, and the consequences of that destruction have been apparent over the last 10 years. So in fact, we, through, through most of our work, it's not even about raising awareness. It's just about facilitating action. You know, we don't, I don't think that we need to raise awareness amongst the people here, amongst the indigenous tribes here, about the importance of forests. You know, I mean, I mean, many of the tribes, many of the people who I meet on the ground know much more about it than I do, because they've grown up in the forest. The only thing that we try and do is facilitate action so that in a span of six months, in a span of one year, if your average household income goes up by 40% by converting your monoculture farm into an agroforest and by planting a few trees, that then drives, you know. And another aspect here, I think, is really trying to work with communities and not with individual groups. I think what, what really helps is to create community power, is to create community autonomy, is to enhance communities' abilities to make decisions. Along with the youth, along with the women, along with the elders, when you do that, then democracy prevails. And then one person's greed, because I mean, you know, one, one person's greed will always be there, you know, but then democracy prevails and community institutions will be strong enough to combat that in the future. So it, it's for the communities to see a greater good, yeah, in preserving yeah. and taking little, which of course uh, uh, will help them sustain. Uh, Hasina, for a person who's been on the ground all the time and worked with individuals, worked with communities, now this uh, uh, vision that you have, of this co-creation, which is a very interesting one, how sustainable is it and how do you intend uh, to take it, uh, you know, um, um, 100 miles, say, to start with? Well, if you're looking at uh, one single organization intervening on, say, migration or stopping slavery or human trafficking, I think it will be next to impossible. And one organization uh, making a value chain from an end to end uh, to create jobs is not possible at all, looking in terms of the population size. And if we are looking at the Eastern Himalayan, uh, countries like Nepal, Myanmar, Bangladesh are also country which has been a source, a transit, and also a destination. And India, for that matter, the Northeast, where we are located, has been the I would say the entry gate of transit point. So if we have to really reduce that and make people choose to stay back home and stay back within their own economics, then we need to actually give them viability within their own community. So viability can only be created if an organization comes together. So it's more, the co-creation model is more on collective leadership because we as an organization over the years has always believed that uh, Leadership cannot be by one single individual, one single organization. Uh, collective leadership will have to engage multiple organizations having common vision, uh, where vision can actually be integrated. Uh, integrated to focus on the larger good and the larger change. And if you're looking at the co-creation between rural futures and impulse model prevention, uh, it's basically making larger change that affects communities, that affects human beings and their rights. So in a democracy, we are talking about human rights. We are talking about our rights and entitlement. But if we don't create you know, economic livelihood, then you know, the rights will only be addressed after they're being exploited. So here we're looking at preventing before exploitation. And the co-creation is going to bring value because the Eastern Himalayan has richness of agriculture, richness of environment, richness of indigenous population. By and large, I think over the years, people have moved out because they didn't see the value of it. Now we are trying to say that through the co-creation, the example and the pilot that has been tested uh, can actually come together, merge together collectively and uh, bring forward more opportunities for the people so that they have choices not to migrate unsafely. Right. And uh, Balipara Foundation, I guess, is bringing together an international community of scientists and experts from all over the world uh, to see that this really does become a reality and works on the ground. So that really helps that. Uh, uh, now, sort of, as far as the brass tacks are concerned, how will it really work? You know, how are you kind of dividing uh, the work uh, between rural futures and uh, impulse? Yeah. So in fact, I mean, are we going to roll it out? And in fact, we, we already have a, a pilot undergoing as we speak in the Garo Hills and, and also in, in Kaziranga. How this really works, Karma, is because we, we currently work in different geographies to the impulse model. The, the impulse model is already working transnationally, which is also our geographic spread 
focus area for, for on-the-ground work. And impulse model interventions have focused on using arts and crafts and culture uh, as a way of restoring people's livelihoods. Our interventions will be linked to engaging people in reforestation groups. In fact, we have already created an, an, an agroforestry group in the Panbari area where, where, where Impulse has been working for the last 20 so years. And our focus is, so we will basically go into a space altogether. Impulse is going to be focusing on their expertise of livelihoods, which is our crafts culture mostly related to weaves. We will be focusing on our implementation focuses, which is creating youth groups to promote agroforestry, organizing group, building group autonomy for reforestation, and showing the paths of how leadership within communities. So in fact, ultimately success of the program is not just leadership between uh, Impulse and Rural Futures, Balipara Foundation, but about all the other organizations that we get, about how we build leadership within communities, and how, because we will not remain in a certain place for more than five to six years, you know, because we'll have to move our focus from here to there, so we can actually scale out. But we have to build local leadership through the youths to ensure that the model goes far beyond me or Hasina or anybody else, you know. So that is the goal, and that, and that has been the primary focus of a lot of my initiatives uh, through the Balipara Foundation, and it's been a, a focus to build leadership in the ground, build local stewardship of natural assets. So I think that the combinatorial approach of building lo local stewardship for the arts and crafts and cultures and local stewardship for natural assets, that is how both the organization's expertises would be mixed. And I think this creates a really holistic framework to create livelihoods that are sustainable and then to give people the autonomy to do whatever they think is best for them with these livelihoods. You know, So as an example, if a community owns a forest, right? Uh, if you are earning, I mean, many of our estimates suggest that from one hectare of forest, you you earn about ten lakh rupees a year. If you have a hundred hectares, that's 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 a lot of money, right? So, what does a community do with that money? Will be democrat in through a democratic fashion be decided by the community. So, if you feel that your school is run down, you can decide to build a new school for your community. You can decide to build a new health healthcare center for your communities. You can decide to transform households. So it's not really only about building livelihoods, mm -hmm. but it is about taking that a step further because I think building livelihoods will not satisfy the aspirations of youth, yeah. right? Youth not only move from Guwahati to Bombay for aspirations, I mean for, for livelihoods, but they also move for aspirations. They want to go to a cinema hall, you know, and you want to meet people of other cultures, yeah. buy a car, for example. So we think that it is possible to create these aspirational futures in rural areas without making them urban areas. India cannot afford more urban areas. All our urban areas are overpopulated and are, and, and are a huge bane on the economy. So by creating these aspirational futures, by giving community power and stewardship of their natural resources, communities will be able to create their vision of an aspirational village. Right. And, uh, Hasina, most of the work here that you're looking at will be through the Impulse Social Enterprises because that's what, you know, that's the organization that's been working on livelihood. Yes, so I mean like Impulse model, I mean the prevention lab actually looks in terms of um, economics and markets and Impulse Social Enterprise is the driver for that. And as a hybrid model, uh, Impulse Social Enterprise has already scaled deep I mean, through the model, we had scaled very deep in terms of building trust uh, among uh, a lot of artisans that we have worked over the years. And that trust factor has also created great leadership. And those leadership are the people themselves who have navigated to expand uh, more artisans to come on board. And that has seen, in fact, during the lockdown and COVID, when the, everybody is migrating, inbound migration was rising, people were losing jobs. The artisans who are part of Impulse Empower, never, no one lost a job. They continue to weave from home. They continue to get their income. And that has attracted more of the people who are coming back and those people who are losing livelihood uh, to see the, the difference that what it means to be back home and doing an economic which is through Impulse Social Enterprise. We have seen that. We have navigated that. And I think scaling 
up for us has been that we are also looking into policy change. So it's a lot of research that we have undertaken. Uh, with the World Bank, we have also taken a research uh, looking at from the lens of UNDP and Asian Development Bank because a lot of infrastructure building will continue to happen, especially in Southeast Asia. Now, with this infrastructure, we also have to see that people will lose their land, they will lose their livelihood, uh, they will be aspirational, as what Saurav said, that a lot of young people will want to go Southeast Asia. So if we have to ensure that the safety nets are being created, then uh, we have to create value of markets, which is actually going to be attractive enough for the young people, which has happened, which has been piloted. We have seen that on the ground, working on the ground, because it has to be attractive for the younger population today. Now, when I use the word attractive for the younger population today, I am using words like younger people are teaching the older artisans how they can speak to, uh, to the world through the social media, how they can market the product through the social media. So that is very engaging. So a mixture of the young and people who have passed generation after generation can actually emerge into a very successful economic support system. And uh, we saw that food security was the question. Uh, we, we had always promoted food security over the years, but we are not an expert in food security and environment. And that's led to the why we are co-creating this whole model, because if we don't co-create, then we cannot give a holistic approach as what Saurav has said. So that is why we have taken this step. And I, I see the value of this step is that people will be self-sufficient. And I think we are talking about SDG goal eight. Uh, the whole world is talking about it, but the real work of SDG Goal 8 can only happen on the ground through co-creation model. And that's why we are taking this, you know, to work together. Right. And uh, sort of at the end of the day, I don't think that there will be any end of the days because, you know, this is something that has to evolve and you have to keep working at it. But um, if you look at the future, what kind of impact, what kind of changes do you see this co-creation bringing yeah. in our farms, in our villages? Yeah. So, Kamba, I think yeah, when you talk about impact, it's very easy in our field to get lost in in the numbers of you know, I mean, the forty percent increase in income and all of that. You know, I, I used to data, earn a thousand. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, I mean, I used to earn thousand rupees. Now I earn ten thousand. I think all of that is important, but I don't think all of that is enough. And in fact, through the four years uh, of our reforestation work, of the agroforestry work on the ground, we have figured this firsthand. You know, I mean, when we talk to donors, I'm not happy by telling donors that, look, we planted 100,000 trees and increase in comes by so much, you know, because I don't think it really means so much in the future. Also, because I don't think that just raising your incomes means that you have a better quality of life. That connection does not exist. So we are trying, trying to develop, in fact, in the process now, something that we call the Rural Futures Index. I'm sure you've heard about the Human Development Index, you've, you've heard about the Gross National Happiness Index. The Rural Futures Index will be not a counter, but an add-on, which will be customized to the Eastern Himalayan zone, which will take into consideration not only the amount of money that you earn, but whether you have access to water, whether you have access to energy, whether you have access to healthcare, and how the environment or the health of the environment around you positively influences all of this, right? So the hypothesis of our co-creation is basically the fact that a healthy environment will lead to healthy, happy communities, right? And when I say healthy, happy communities, you have livelihoods, you have food, you have water, and you don't need to be elsewhere to earn a livelihood, but you can go elsewhere for a holiday. So, so I think that the ultimate impact will be to create communities that feel that they are well and communities that feel that they have the ability to change their own future. So one, one term that we use very often in our work is socioeconomic mobility, which is different to livelihoods, right? Livelihoods, we've talked about this. Socioeconomic mobility is the ability of a son or a daughter to do something that the parents or grandparents have never done before. That is what we want to create. So we want to create aspirational areas where if you want to be a doctor, you can go and be a doctor. Yeah. If you want to be an artist, you can go and be an artist. So now, I mean, talking about the numbers, right? Because it's important as well. And I'm sure that many donors will watch this and they will want to know what the numbers are all about. So in a span of two, two and a half years, we've been able to increase incomes across all the communities that we've worked with by about 40%. In a span of seven to two, 10 years, these numbers are projected to go up by 120%. 
and the fact that these communities will then have community funds to say create a school or you know create create things like that in terms of impact also we think that it is not enough for us to just work in the northeast of india uh, and the fact that we have to scale out while we continue to scale deep in the areas where we work now so we do hope to take this co-creation forward to our neighboring countries in nepal uh, myanmar bangladesh and in the near future also in bhutan mm-hmm. through a spirit of partnership and through a spirit of indigenous leadership so that really i think is the goal and the day i mean i'm hoping in the next 3 years 4 years when we can say that we have created indigenous leaders who are taking this co-creation forward in their respective areas i think that is success okay so you say the income will increase by 40% um, and 120% at the latest stage but i'm guessing the base will be very low isn't it here in the northeast yeah so i mean average incomes in assam is about 50000 rupees a year as of now so the base basal rural incomes in assam is still a bit higher than anywhere else in the northeast but the assam average data is about 50% and in my experience it varies between 30 and 70% 30 and 70000 rupees a year right. yeah so i'll take the same question to you now, what kind of impact will you be happy with Well, we're looking right now. I think uh, the artisans who have been part and process of the work that we have been working the last thirteen years, uh, working just two to three hours a day, which is, um, you know, not actually governed by any enterprise or businesses. They choose that because it's very entrepreneurial. Uh, they are earning like five to six thousand a month. So that itself is an additional add-on income, which the women are being able to bring home. and it also create a gender equity in terms of the participation of both men and women within the communities because that has been existing in traditional indigenous population where i think it got washed out by the world where they didn't really see the gender equity because you see the family in the farm as well as in the home so we are creating that because we saw that the women was bringing income which is additional and the men are also participating uh, in the process and i think with the value addition of um, agri as well as agroforestry and others it is going to merge in to bring in more women and men and other gender participation in a more holistic way and i think 5 to 6000 a month which is already proven record of 6 i mean 13 years now with an add on of what you know agroforestry can bring it is going to be a huge amount where you have your own resources you have your own land you have your own spaces around and that makes a lot of difference you know So I think aspiration in terms of finance right. is going to change the way you value everything that you have around yourself. Right. Well, with that, we've uh, come uh, to the end of this talk. I'm afraid we've run out of time. I'd like to thank uh, Hasina and Sir. Thank you very much for speaking to us. Uh, we wish you well. It's a very interesting uh, project, and we certainly hope that uh, going ahead, uh, it will uh, put an end to unsafe migration and also protect our forests. and environment Thank you everyone as we come to the end of our discussions today we have with us his excellency Vikram Dorai Swami who would be sharing with us his key leadership address and closing comments on ecology is economy Please welcome His Excellency Vikram Dorai Swami, High Commissioner of India to Bangladesh. Okay. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your time and joining us for this most important discussion on ecology's economy. As we come to the end of this forum, we seek your insights. as a leading voice in the eastern himalayan region to inspire us as we build the road map for investing in the new wealth of nations with this i um i put forward a question to you on how relevant is the idea of ecology's economy today in the global context well thank you first of all for the opportunity to be part of this very important discussion i recognize the excellent work the balipara foundation is doing and uh, in sort of looking at the trans boundary and trans regional aspects of economics environment uh, 
people-to-people -people ties and everything that is relevant to our existence on this planet. Um, the question that you ask is a very valid one. I think uh, the only thing I would perhaps take issue with is the question of whether this is a current issue or has it always been an issue? You could go all the way back to the early modern age when Mahatma Gandhi talked about um, the importance, in a sense, of managing our existence on the planet in a sustainable way. Uh, he put it uh, in his inimitable, pithy way uh, when he talked about um, the world having enough for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. Um, it's important to look at this and figure out where we are going at this sort of global moment of pause that the pandemic has created and figure out whether our sort of unhesitating reliance on the market purely as a means of guiding our uh, actions uh, as businesses, as government, if that is wholly and solely enough. I think there are therefore several points that we need to look at. The idea of looking at economics and ecology as a connected space is important because as we sometimes look in business or in government, we tend to look in silos. We tend to look at things in silos. And the idea of connecting ecology with economics is to go beyond looking at purely an economic need or an economic rationale for a certain set of activities. When you factor in the environment, when you factor in uh, people's needs, you factor in the larger ecological context of your actions. Uh, those are matters that formal economics often doesn't price it into an economic decision. It's important increasingly today to do so for the, for, for the following reasons. One, uh, it's fairly obvious that we are reaching the limits of uh, environmental capacity to deal with the anthropomorphic impact of human activity on the planet. Now, conventional economics, uh, The Economist magazine, for instance, would argue, and market would tend to support it, the idea that eventually people are prepared to pay more for a better resource. So if oil is beginning to become harder to get, eventually it will be priced in a manner that makes it possible to use new technologies to access hard to reach kinds of hydrocarbons like shale gas or shale oil or oil sands in Canada. Now, the question that you have to ask is, is the market pricing everything? And I think the answer to that is probably not, because it is not pricing in the issue, for instance, of the limits of resource uh, or the limits of waste upon growth. When you're not pricing that in, then that becomes a larger problem. So, you know, a preliminary effort has already been made in the form of carbon cap and trade uh, to try and price in uh, the environment as an externality. But I would argue that environmental economics or an economics environmental based approach to economics should not price it in as an externality, but as an internality, so to speak, because unless you take it in as an embedded cost, you will never be able to come to the true price of the impact we exercise on the environment. So I think therefore it is extremely important. Thank you. And so I think you're, yeah. So you're rightly put like it is important to for the inter interdependence to actually work together, it is important we look beyond and actually look at the economic rational. And so uh, moving ahead, I would like to ask you the next question, uh, which is about how can we invest in and build restorative value change to achieve net zero and create green jobs for people and economy? Yeah. So, you know, I think that's a very well-connected segue onto the first question that you right. asked. Um, the important question is how do we begin to start revisiting our assumptions of what the cost of certain actions are, or all our actions are. Uh, and as I suggested, uh, leading on from my last sentence, uh, the process of factoring in these impacts, the cost of such impacts on the larger environment is critical. Um, so as I said, making it an internality, how do you price, uh, say for instance, clean air, clean water, uh, unpolluted soil. Today in Delhi, for instance, uh, air pollution is a huge uh, challenge, right? Because the cost of polluting the air has not been factored into the cost of, uh, for instance, either construction activity or the burning of stubble. I'm not blaming anybody, but what I'm saying yeah. is there is a cost. So who, who pays that cost? Today, everybody pays it, whether they yeah. can afford it or not. So yeah. 
putting that cost in is critical. I'd say it's important if we can start revisiting the pricing of, of products to include uh, three major, major sort of uh, kinds of pricing, sustainability of scale, uh, fair distribution, and efficient allocation of, uh, of resources. So, so far, each of these has been looked at purely in econometric terms, the efficiency of allocation, the market will price in the most efficient use of a particular resource. But as I suggested, there are uh, public goods or larger global goods that you don't price in. You don't price in the cost of mercury-free oceans when you eat fish. But eventually, the price of medical care that is going to come about from eating contaminated fish is much higher than the pricing of, of sustainable fish. So movements that are now coming in to put economic uh, and environmentally sound economics into pricing are critical. And we need to have governments take the lead in this because until that is done, uh, it will always be difficult for uh, businesses which are aimed at achieving the highest uh, margin of profitability against the lowest margin of cost uh, to price things in, in a more efficient manner. So this requires kind of a people's movement to bring in these three factors that I suggested into the larger pricing mechanisms. I think if we could look at um, um, the, the concept of how we look at environmental structures and how these factor into our, uh, our larger economic activity, I think that would be a much better, much better, much better way forward. We need to recognize that markets do very well in terms of pricing when they are dealing with goods that are um, sort of competing or rival goods or goods that are exclu excludable. But you, but you know, there is no alternative to clean air or clean water. So it's very difficult to price that in. How do you price and what is the actual price of uh, air that is unpolluted? You know, maybe Bhutan has the answer because they were sure yeah. that they have unpolluted air. Right. But, uh, but for the rest of us living in the plains, it's difficult to price in uh, the cost right. of, of yeah. unpolluted air. So, uh, you know, um, I think it's important to be able to look at public goods, private goods, pricing, uh, what does the market price in, what does society price in, can you create trust-based systems where all sort of uh, citizens of a community are stakeholders in collective resources and public yeah. goods. And therefore those then get priced in, in the total cost of production. I mean, these are just ideas. Obviously, yeah, nobody has I the know. answers. If I had the answers, I wouldn't be sitting here. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so, no, I think, uh, rightly said, and I think it is important to learn how do we value these uh, natural resources and how do we measure these natural assets. And with this, um, I would ask you the last question. Uh, what are the key recommendations you would suggest for the Eastern Himalayas for these structural transformations to happen for the future sustainable milestones? Well, that's a big question. I don't know if I'm qualified to give uh, recommendations on this, but but let's let's take, for instance, uh, a step back from where we are today, and look at the region from a from a larger historical perspective. Uh, by that, I'm saying let's go back 200 years, 300 years, uh, say even before the Battle of Palasi, and say what has been the impact of our current modern system on creating, in other words, in a sense, duplicated infrastructure and duplicated systems of function. Can we see if we can reduce the, the, the sort of uh, duplicated impact we have on our environment in uh, this entire space? Um, traditionally, let me be more specific. Traditionally, uh, we used river water systems which flowed in the right direction for raw materials to come downstream, be processed and be moved out. Um, it was all based on a sort of uh, sustainable, harvestable uh, production because you couldn't harvest more than you actually had. So you harvested uh, forestry produce, you harvested fishery resources from the water, you harvested grain from the land or tea from the plantations and you moved it downriver. Uh, so you needed less energy to be able to do some of that. You used, subsequently, you, you could use the river for uh, run of the river uh, power generation projects. But then with the partition of the, of the region into multiple states, we've then stopped being able to plan in a larger uh, sort of sub-regional footprint. 
So maybe it's possible for us to look at a more sub-regional approach to development, uh, to start pricing in the totality of costs that we all pay, whether the river is polluted in India or in Bangladesh or in Bhutan, uh, or, uh, or even indeed in Myanmar or China, it doesn't really matter. Ultimately, we're all paying the same price for it. So creating that larger regional sense of investment in um, the, the larger sort of sub-regional good and investing in sub-regional approaches to development, to trade, to, 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 to sort of um, harnessing of resources, I think would be one very strong way of bringing this in. Another important factor would be to create um, uh, more knowledge sharing about the impact of our current set of activities and, and in understanding how these connect up with problems upriver, downriver, how, how, in other words, there is a connectedness to everything that we've done uh, in the region and how even solutions can therefore be, can therefore require to be um, taken forward in a more regional approach rather than an individual country or individual district-based approaches. I think that would be two major ways of doing this. A third would be to, to sort of um, utilize scale. So if, for instance, um, certain technologies, or certain resource-based uh, 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 industries are moving to less impactful, environmentally impactful uh, systems of production, maybe we should see how those can be scaled up reducing the cost by uh, by addressing these or deploying these within the re within the region and sub region so uh, again planning for environmentally low impact uh, developmental economics and uh, market based activities should also include a regional and sub regional dimension again that tends not to happen we tend to look at these things within our borders right, in each of our countries i think perhaps that could also be one of the approaches that the uh, uh, naturenomics forum could take forward all said and done, I, I think there'd be there'd be a lot of interest in seeing how recommendations from this edition of the Naturenomics Forum could come up with new thinking on uh, our collective approach to management of our fragile ecology, particularly in the Himalayan region and the trans right. and sub Himalayan region, and to contribute something constructive to the what uh, 350 million people who live just in this eastern portion of. Uh, Bangladesh, Eastern India, and uh, Bhutan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the great recommendations. And uh, we'll be in contact. Thank you. Look forward to seeing this again. Bye-bye. Thanks. us with your thoughts on how we can explore the new paradigm of ecology is economy across the globe and the eastern Himalayas. With this we come to an end to the fourth day of the eighth edition of Eastern Himalayan Naturenomics Forum 2020. Hope you all enjoyed the thought-provoking sessions that were discussed up and extensively, covering all the aspects of ecology is economy in the past three days. We believe the key highlights from all the discussions will help us to prepare a structured global action agenda towards initiating the ecological revolution where ecology is economy. Ladies and gentlemen, the eighth edition of the Balipara Foundation Awards will be held tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. where we will celebrate 13 great earth heroes and their exceptional work. We request you all to log in tomorrow at 4.30 to watch the same. This is Ipsita Hajarika. Goodbye for now. Yeah.